This episode of the Scene in the Unseen is brought to you by Intel. How do we see the world? A glib answer to that is differently. You and I can stand at a crowded intersection and look out into the world and see totally different things. Indeed, we could look at the same rock and see two different rocks. The world is the scene and the unseen, and the scene is such a small part of it. This is why I love reading literature. Books open windows for us into other worlds, even when they are set in the same world as ours. For those who don't read, you have one life to live. For those who do read, there is no end to lives and to seeing. Now, while I do read a lot, my biggest complaint about myself is that I don't see enough. I go places, I do things, but I remain stuck inside my own head. But a writer has to learn to see. How else can you build worlds for others? This is why I enjoy chatting with novelists on this show. Each of them sees the world in a unique way. And when they share some of that with me, I can also see a little better. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is Sarah Rai, a writer, a novelist who straddles multiple languages and multiple worlds. Sarah is a granddaughter of the great Munshi Premchand, the giant of Hindi literature, but she doesn't often like this fact mentioned because, hey, she stands out as a literary figure and as a person in her own right. She is equally at ease with Hindi, Urdu and English, and all her fiction, in fact, is written in Hindi. But she's translated writers like Vinod Kumar Shukla into English, as well as some of her own work. I met Sarah when I agreed to be on the jury of the JCB Literature Prize this year and Sarah was ahead of the jury. These are COVID times, so our jury meetings would happen on Zoom. The five of our jury members would gather to discuss a fixed number of books every week and Sarah would lead the discussion by talking about each book in detail. For me, and I think for all the other jury members, it was a jaw-dropping experience. She would talk about each book with such depth that she taught us not just something about the book all of us had read, but also something about reading itself. I figured that whenever we could meet in person, I simply had to record an episode with Sarah. So finally, in the second week of November, we made it happen. She was passing through Mumbai, I invited her home for lunch and a recording in my home studio, and we had the conversation you will hear now. I loved having this conversation, and I loved listening to it again later, because I love books and writing, and Sarah reminds me why. Listen in, I think you'll like it as well. But before that, a quick commercial break. My listeners often ask me, how do you manage your time? How do you manage your workflows, your research, so on and so forth? This is also a question I often ask my guests. We are limited by our brains, by the organic matter we are made up of. And there is only so much energy and bandwidth we have to use in one day. Thank goodness we have technology to help us manage these challenges. And the sponsor of this episode, Intel, actually helps technology in the same way that technology helps us. As I've mentioned in commercials in previous episodes, Intel's 11th Gen V Pro platform helps companies boost their performance and security. And it does more than this. It also makes it easy to manage a large number of PCs across business locations remotely. Intel's V Pro platform enables IT professionals to discover, repair, protect, and even turn turbocharge networked systems. It is an unseen force behind the fact that all this technology around us keeps working smoothly. Intel's vPro platform is built for business wherever business happens. Sarah, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. Thank you, Amit. I'm so pleased to be here and so nice to meet you finally in person. I've kind of been waiting for a long time to record this uh, episode. But one of the things that I wasn't very happy about while researching for the episode is that there's so little of your writing actually available in English. Like I read a couple of great stories by you, which we'll talk about. And also this wonderful essay you wrote for uh, Caravan, which was so rich in impressions and ideas. But, um, you know, as you came in, you just mentioned that you've also got other essays in the pipeline, including one that talks about memories and the layers of memories that builds one's life. So, and you kindly offered to read it out for us. So I'm going to take you up on that offer. Tell me a little bit about this essay and then go uh, ahead. Amit, it's uh, basically, it's going to form the preface uh, to my book of autobiographical essays that I'm writing. Uh, the book is almost done. I think maybe one more essay left to write. And it's basically a family memoir kind of thing, but it's not actually linear uh, thing. Like all the sep essays are separate. They are usually about a place, a house or a person, various people in my family. So they are all interconnected essays. 
uh, but they are not necessarily one uh, continuous narrative like that. So this piece that I wrote, which is quite a short piece, really, I mean, I intended it as a preface. I'm still not really sure whether I should use it as a preface. Uh, but it's basically about living in a house, which is a family house in Allahabad, in Draman Road. In, in it, the house is also a character. The house is a character in the sense that, I mean, it describes the house, the rooms inside and how people lived in it and my memories of those people who are not there anymore. So it sort of starts off like that. So uh, that's that, that's the beginning of my... Wonderful. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So should I read it out now? Please, absolutely. Okay, right. Uh, so the piece is called Palimpsest. And uh, well, anyway, I'll just read it out so I don't have to... I mean, I'm not going to explain what it is about because the listeners will get the sense of it. It's called Palimpsest. There is something melancholy in the act of writing about one's past. This is especially the case if most of that past has taken place in the same house in which you still live. It is your family home, the same house where you have always lived, and yet it is different. There were people who lived here, but many of them are no longer alive. Absent, they are still palpable. The air is saturated with their presence, their invisible script written upon each corner of the house. You pull the door, and with a creaking of springs, it opens. The rooms are all there. You feel the volume of the space. You know the pictures that were on the walls, the exact position of the furniture, the objects in the room. Nothing has changed. But everything feels changed. You remember the way light fell from the skylights, some of which are now blocked up or have disappeared in changes made to the house. There are cobwebs hanging from ceilings, too high to be cleaned, not that you want to clean them. There are termites too that swarm out of the ground and make mud tubes reaching the most unlikely of places. You can, if you listen hard, hear the quiet clicking sounds they make as they move and munch away at the woodwork, hidden from sight. You want to disturb nothing. Each space in the house has a history and it's as if everything in it casts a shadow has a sort of ghost life. You try to catch the shadows, to pin them down, but it is not easy. The harder you try, the more elusive becomes the business of shadows, and you come away with nothing. You become obsessed with mirrors. Some mirrors are blind and reveal nothing. There are others in which you look and find in your face your mother or your grandmother, you see resemblances and patterns you had not noticed before. You hold up your hand to the mirror and look at the blue veins on your hands that taper into the fingers with their neatly paired nails. The prominent, busy lines intersect and connect with the lesser ones, like so many rivers meeting with their tributaries on the triangular delta of your hand. With a start, you realize that it is your mother's hand you are looking at. It is then that you know that you cannot ever be separated from your history. Your past is embedded in your body. But sometimes mirrors are false, distorted, damaged, or askew. These are the abstract mirrors, mirrors that you have imagined into being and that can play a trick on you. There is a patch of black chilies in the garden, black leaves, deep mauve flowers, and the little chilies like black tongues. They look mysterious, with a hint of virulence about them. Watch out for those black tongues. They can put a hex on you. The black tongues curse, and the curse comes true. You think of the chilies when you look at a photograph taken on Noros in the year 1971. White was the color for that year. It was the year of peace. Everyone in the photo is dressed in white, and all the food on the dastarkhan is also white. You look at the faces in the photo and realize that all of those 12 people, except for you and your sister, are dead. There is nothing strange about that. Everyone dies. This is no narrative of loss. Dying is merely a function of living. But then you see your mother. She is wearing a white sari printed with a paisley pattern in green, 
Short sighted, she always wears glasses, and these particular ones have an onion pink frame. The family has gathered round the teapot in the front veranda of the house. Uncharacteristically, she does not participate at all in the conversation, while a mysterious smile plays on her lips. Quite suddenly, with an absolutely impassive face, she winks. Only then do you see that the lens from that side of her spectacles is missing. It is a comic moment and everyone laughs, but it also brings home to you that there is much that you do not see. Your father comes to you when you are not thinking about him. He is laughing. He does not speak, but he laughs. His laughter is loud and resonant and the whole room rings with it. It flows down the stairs in a stream of gushing sound and it gathers in a pool at the bottom of the steps. It rests on the laburnum that is in full bloom, startling into flight a flock of roosting sparrows. His body shakes, his eyes fill with tears. It is not clear whether the laughter is happy or despairing. One day, you enter a room and you find your brother sitting there. He leans back and closes his eyes, as he does when he doesn't want to listen to what is being said. His wife is speaking. She is always speaking. A complicated web of lies floats just beneath her skin. For 26 years, he has tried to get to the meaning of what she says. But the truth can just be glimpsed in flashes, for it can be found only in what she has not said. None of this happens, of course. It cannot, because none of these people are here any longer. It's the mirror again, your personal mirror that keeps reflecting the past moments of which your life is composed. It invents some of those moments too, and you can never be sure if something really happened. The strange thing about living in the same house all your life is that you cannot go back to it, because for you are still in it, and yet you keep going back. It is not the house that you are returning to, but a time. The house merely holds the accumulations of the years, evidence to the many layers of living in it that are transposed one upon another. You turn the thing things of the house over in your hands, curious objects, threadbare fabric, rusty biscuit tins holding loose, clattering buttons of all description, old watches that stopped long ago, opaque lamp chimneys, issues of Lilliput magazine yellowed with age, and you don't want to let go of anything. For those things, unbeknownst to you, have become part of who you are. Sitting on the terrace, you look about you. The Argeria nervosa has spread its abundant foliage all over one side of the house. It's the elephant creeper. It grows rapidly. So quickly, in fact, that you feel it has grown another tendril or two in the moment that you looked away. You wonder if its roots go as deep into the earth as the plant does into the air. It has the house and you firmly in its grip. You shake yourself and try to leave. You've been trying to leave for years, fearing that in this stationary town with its two rivers and its narrow roads, you'll become a pumpkin or a god. You look at other houses in other cities. Other lives flash across your mind. Hypothetical lives lived hypothetically for you know that you will never go away. The house will never, never let you go. That's, that's so beautiful and, and very moving. And I love that image of a pumpkin or a god in this small <laughs> town. Uh, this reminded me of a poem by Konstantin Kavafi called The City. Have you read it? Oh, that? yes. I love that poem. It's one of my favorites. Let me read it out for my listeners because yes, it's such please, a love. And please, th yeah. this, this was so reminiscent of that. Uh, the City by C.P. Kavafi. You said... I'll go to another country, go to another shore, find another city better than this one. Whatever I do is fated to turn out wrong and my heart lies buried like something dead. How long can I let my mind molder in this place? Wherever I turn, wherever I look, I see the black ruins of my life here, where I've spent so many years, wasted them, destroyed them totally. And now there's a stop quote within the poem and the narrator continues. You won't find a new country, won't find another shore. This city will always pursue you. You'll walk the same streets, grow old in the same neighborhoods, turn Turn grey in these same houses. You'll always end up in this city. Don't hope for things elsewhere. There's no ship for you. There's no road. Now that you've wasted your life here in this small corner, you've destroyed it everywhere in the world. Beautiful. It's such a lovely poem. It's a very nice poem. I love that. I mean, Kawafi is also one of my favorite poets. 
Wow. And this one, out of the uh, other poems, I like this one too. Yeah, I kind of love this one the most actually out of all his work because it yeah. speaks yeah. so much to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, one of the things that I think all all our listeners would have noticed while while you read that passage out, and that I constantly kept noticing when I read all your essays and your stories, and I'll come back to that. You know, as we reach those particular pieces, is your power of observation. Like all these little details that you're coming out with. Like one thing I tell my writing students all the time is avoid the abstract, go for the concrete. There's a lot of richness there. Now, I'm kind of curious about. is this power of observation something that was always part of you or is it something that you felt the need to cultivate as a writer because another sort of journey you've spoken about is of being a young writer like you 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 know you've spoken of the bungalows of allahabad and how they were all so far away from each other and you were like an island and you had no sense of that larger society around you so you were like a writer without material you knew there was a writer inside you but you had no material which is how when i look back on my 20s it was kind of exactly like Like that, that you want to write, but you haven't lived enough to write. So this acute power of observation has it always been there, even before you had this consciousness of wanting to write. Uh, Amit, uh, I think I think the power of observation also comes from dullness. I know okay. it sounds like the complete opposite of what we are trying to get at, but uh, it's the dull uh, dull day on which nothing is happening. you are there quietly by yourself and you're looking around you're looking at things so uh, you tend to notice much more because you're not your mind is not distracted and uh, i mean what you said about the bungalows and how i lived i mean i spent my early years and i still do in fact live in the same bungalow though the city itself has changed quite a lot uh, but uh, my early years were very quiet years in the sense that nothing was happening these bungalows ilahabad is a city of bungalows that had been built by the brits long ago and many of those bungalows have now gone they've been demolished but ours is one of the few bungalows that remains so my life in those bungalows was one of solitude i would say even as a child i mean there were not many people to be met and uh, neighbors were far away and we were not really particularly interacting with the neighbors so it was a uh, a lot of space around you and you could sort of wander about in that space climb trees I even chewed leaves to find out if they're poisonous. <laughs> Were they so, <laughs> obviously not? <laughs> yeah, so I survived that. But I mean, there were all these experiments that could be done, and you could just observe nature and observe. I mean, it became like a uh, examining everything under a mi- microscope, really, because I mean, nothing else was going on to uh, take your attention. There were birds, bird calls, all these things you were noticing. So it was, in a sense, an idyllic life. But of course, it was. far away from other people so while writing stories one also has to know those people and in india that already comes with a challenge because all the names for instance of people they come with their background you know mr junjunwala or mr gupta or mr shivastav mrs uh, dhondi or whatever you know these people all have different sets of geographical and also cultural sort of uh, features so you already don't have that which was what i found difficult in the beginning when i started to write that living in a bungalow like this basically uh, you don't really i mean there's the linguistic aspect also of it which is that uh, in the kind of house that i grew up uh, there were many books and books in several languages and uh, the languages that i heard around me like uh, we spoke hindustani at home in school it was english and we were supposed to be fined if we spoke in hindi so so that never really happened i mean we were not fined and people spoke in hindi all the time but that was the thing that they did not encourage speaking in hindi in school and at home we were embarrassed to speak in english because our family had a sort of linguistic pride i did not sort of uh, nobody none of us spoke in english at home and uh, then there was the avadhi that was spoken around us like people by so the servants for instance they spoke avadhi and other people around that who had a rural background they were speaking in avadhi my grandmother spoke bhojpuri because i mean she came from uh, i mean from that side further east uh, up banaras was my i mean lamahi actually that's a village called lamahi which is about 3 miles away from banaras and there's bhojpuri spoken over there so she would speak bhojpuri and uh, bangla my father was a, a fluent bangla speaker and uh, well he spoke bangla quite obviously if he found out that you knew bangla he would always prefer to speak in bangla and not in hindi or bhojpuri 
but he spoke to his mother in Bhojpuri. So there was all these sort of uh, sounds sort of falling, you know, a kind of multilingual sort of thing that was constantly. And that's that's not uh, my situation particularly in India because it there are many people who would have a similar experience of many languages being spoken around them. So there was this thing of which language to write in. You know, when I started out writing, I mean, I wondered because English, I was quite fluent with English. And my reading was in English. In school, we were taught to write in English. So it seemed that perhaps one should write in English. But then while speaking, I was more comfortable with Hindustani. So there was this whole struggle going on, groping for language, as it were, to which language to write in. And uh, th uh, this uh, sort of lack of a language and then the lack of material because I didn't really know anyone around. So all these kind of added up to a sort of angst about writing, which I was not able, uh, able to overcome for a very long time. And this flight of writing from writing fiction pursued me for a long time, long, long time. And I think finally in my 40s, I started writing something like that. So I'll, I'll take your point about dullness being a factor for noticing. But the point is, generations of people went through the similar dullness and, uh, you know, didn't emerge with, you know, didn't have those powers of observation, frankly. I mean, I kind of didn't. I mean, that is, if there is one thing that I think I lacked, it was this looking at everything with that acute glance. Very often I've kind of eaten a meal and you could ask me later, what did it taste like? And I wouldn't have noticed because that mindfulness mm. is just not there. So a lot of threads to pick up on. But when you spoke about languages, like elsewhere, you've spoken about how your uh, mother Zerarai uh, and her sister Mughal Mosud, you know, they used to write in Urdu and then they used to also publish it in Hindi because yes. of, you know, easier to get published that way. And they would tell each other stories and they would add a fur sound, F sound, yeah. so that other people couldn't make out what they were yeah. saying because this one consonant yes. would be really yes. prominent and all that. And I imagine that that would lead to a, a heightened mindfulness of language itself. Like, what is it doing? You know, what? how are the different yeah. sounds interacting? How does something sound? Yeah. How different kind of words come together? Like the exact same example that I mentioned about food could be a very bad habit for a writer. Mm. Where if you're not mindful of language yeah. at yeah. all. And, and of course, most of the writing one does is kind of an autopilot, but you arrive at that autopilot and you build that reflexive style by first being mindful. Hmm. So was there a sense when you were kind of growing up, uh, was there a sense where language was important? Were you thinking of language differently from, say, you know, the people you went to school with at St. Mary's or whatever? Was there that kind of close attention to what words are being used, how a story is being constructed and so on? Well, actually, uh, in my family, language was one thing that was constantly spoken about. I mean, people, if there was some word, for instance, that appeared that you did not know, immediately a dictionary would be fished out and the word would be make, made, you know, uh, clear. And also sometimes go into the root of that word, whether it was coming from Arabic or Persian or whatever, you know, depends um, which word, which language the word belonged to. So there was this very heightened consciousness of language in my family. And as you said, I mean, my mother and my aunt both wrote their stories first in Urdu, uh, which was their primary language. And uh, then because of ease of publication and just wider reach of publication, they switched and they wrote uh, their scripts out again in Hindi. And uh, in, they were constantly, I mean, they, their early education, they did not go to school. The Malvi used to come at home uh, to teach them. And of course, they, were, they had many tales about how they used to give the Malvi the slip. Like he would come and uh, Malvi Sahab was very fond of his opium. <laughs> so he'd come and he'd sit down and he'd set them the work for that day and he'd put on, have his opium and then he'd fall into a deep sleep. So these kids, I mean, they're really wicked kids, I think. I mean, they were sort of, uh, they're pretending to sort of move backward and forward, learning their Farsi and learning their poetry and all that. And then... Uh, uh, they would go to the kitchen and pick up this huge uh, tin thali from there and bang on it with a huge stone. So this sounded like the bell that came from the town hall at uh, 12 <laughs> o'clock or whatever. And they sort of, the Malvi Sahib would wake up suddenly and say, oh, what was that? Is, there, is it time? You know, has the gajar baj gaya? You know, gajar baj tha. So gajar baj gaya meant that his lesson was over. So, ha ha, Malvi Sahib, hum to ek ghante se par rahe hai, you know, and whatever. And then he'd shuffle off and the lesson would be over and then they'd be free to do all their little pranks all over the place. So, I mean, so they never really had a formal education in that sense. But even so, they were really well versed in their Farsi and their Urdu and they knew all these couplets. And for every occasion, they'd come up with, uh, you know, a suitable couplet. 
So all this whole thing of many languages was already there at home. You know, one could hear this. And these languages sort of went into a sleeping pool of languages, I would say, inside me, which never emerged at that point. But uh, there's this whole mysterious thing about writing, that when you sit down to write, it's like one word follows another. And somehow what emerges is what you may have felt, say, 40 years ago, and you don't know which bird it was singing in the pine tree on which particular Sunday or which line someone said that is suddenly going to surface when you're writing. And you will not be able to think of that when you're actually not writing. So it's a very mysterious and a very magical process. So language too is part of that. You know, the words for these things come when you're actually writing them and they are somewhere in your submerged memory and you don't remember them. If you consciously try to remember them, they will not come out. So that's how languages have worked for me. You know, it's something, it's more a process of absorption. You know, it's just something that is going inside you and is waiting for that time. So, I mean, when you put it down on paper, it's just something, Just it's like when you put this lemon juice on, you know, if you write something with lemon juice and you iron it, then the writing appears, otherwise it's invisible. So it's a bit like that, you know. So these things are already within you and when you write, they just... You recognize them rather than remember them. That's beautiful. So the writing is already there and the process of yeah. writing is like the act of ironing. You yes, just yes, absolutely. Make it visible. absolutely. I'm also fascinated by a sort of another thread that came up when you were reading that piece that comes up now, that comes up in your other work, which is sort of the thread of memory. Like I did an episode with Anjal Malhotra, who had uh, done a very fine book on uh, partition, you know, just looking at the objects people carried with them during mm. partition and the memories uh, that they carried. And like while researching for that, one of the things I realized was that how memory works in the brain is that when you remember something, you're remembering what happened. But every subsequent time, you're remembering the last remembering of it. And therefore, over a period of time, uh, your memories can grow richer or can grow fade or can have other layers painted onto them by whatever, which is why, you know, sometimes if you shared a memory with someone 20 years ago and you both discuss it, you might find that both of you remember it completely differently. Yeah, While yeah, one would assume yeah. the instant after it happened, it would have been the same thing. But mm. over time, it's kind of changed. And what I find in your essays and so on is that there is a lot of very deep remembering. And I say deep remembering, not just in a sense of events, but also all these impressionistic details that are kind of all over the place. I uh, saw my father struggle with Parkinson's before he passed away. And his memory was kind of going before that for a few years. And one of the things that, one of the common phenomena in people whose memory goes in old age in which uh, I saw in my father was that the edges remain very stark. So you remember what happened yesterday and you remember what happened when you were 10. And it's those middle periods which kind of um, tend to go. And uh, I remember once he asked me that, you know, what were you like growing up? Because I don't remember. I think about that because when I look back on my own process of remembering things, you know, some people that never had meaning suddenly have meaning because of the way I have changed or um, just the nature of memory changes and one forgets so much. So since you have both been someone who is playing around a lot in that pool of memories, both in your writing and uh, I'm, I'm sure in these autobiographical essays as well, which I can't wait to read. And as someone who is deeply self-reflective, what are sort of your thoughts on this? Like, is there a sense in which your life at 10 is being more richly lived now than it was when you were 10? I think I think that is true because actually uh, I've always thought, in fact, I wrote about this in my novel also, that uh, the past actually never dies. The past becomes present for you when you remember it. So in a sense, uh, there is no past. I mean, everything, when at the moment of remembering, it's, you're living it, right? I mean, sort of, uh, it's just there for you. Uh, so, uh, and also memory is changing. You said that, like, you may remember something and last time it was completely different. I think that's what fiction is all about. Perhaps life is a fiction, you know, because you live things and uh, later you remember them. It's something else you remember. And when you're writing about it, some other thing happens, you know. So it's all part of this whole mysterious universe of words and memories and how words recall those memories which uh, keeps changing and if two people have uh, say been through some incident together their remembering of it can be completely different we just don't know it's also the individual perception of things that comes into play and uh, people uh, some person may remember a certain thing about that day the other person may remember something else so it just becomes like that different memories 
so it's these various layers and uh, various sort of submersions i would say and uh, things that you come up with that just add to the whole persona of the writer i think i mean it's just people do a lot of detective work for instance when you're writing something you publish a story so people oh this is about this one you know <laughs> people say and and it's a very irritating question for any writer because when when i'm writing for instance the story has to be grounded somewhere you can't base it in some fictional place it has to be a place that you know and you can write the details of but the story itself when it's put into that background into that ground rather uh, is a fictional story so i mean it's not about so and so or you know you so people always try to find parallels especially people who know you try to find parallels in your stories but i think that is a completely sort of uh, not a good way of looking at sort of writing like that but uh, i think uh, we live our lives largely as fiction you know and the memories that get created are also fiction from that point of view yeah fa- fascinating to think of it like that tell me a bit more about your childhood because you know got this collection of uh, your grandfather munshi premchand's uh, uh, collected stories which had an introduction um, by you and in in that introduction you wrote and i'll read this bit out a mention of babuji would crop up in conversation the simplicity with which he chose to live his life his idealism and high moral standards his loud and infectious laughter his writing at odd hours of the night or early in the morning often by light of a hurricane lamp his commitment to the oppressed and downtrodden his belief that money corrupts the notion that being poor is somehow spiritually exalting a li- little hypocritically permeated the atmosphere in our well to do home so much so that as a child when asked once what i'd like to be when i grew up i answered that i'd like to be poor the his inability to clear a qualifying entrance exam for college because his maths was weak the particular vegetables he'd been advised not to eat because of his poor digestion talk about him was frequent and he was never far from us hovering benignly in our consciousness a somewhat larger than life figure in the family cupboard to be thought of with pride stop quote how was it sort of like growing up in Premchand's household, who's outside the household, of course, is a legend and much loved by people in a very a visceral way, as you go on to describe later in the essay. But at the same time, like you know, like your uh, sort of answer about how I'd like to be poor when I grow up, I I, I guess did that aura of um, Premchand, and also did the sort of uh, you, your family was very literary. Both your parents were artists and they were accomplished. In fact, your um, grandmother herself was uh, a very formidable person, and I'll ask you more about her later. But growing up then, as as you did, what was that like? Did it set you apart from everyone else? Did you have this sort of feeling that I have to live up to this like earlier you mentioned you were scared to speak english at home because hey you know the greatest hindi writers home so tell me a little bit about uh, you know how that played out it was actually a fear of standing apart you know i mean uh, because in school i mean in the hindi book obviously i mean every year we would have a premchand story in the uh, book that we were taught and i would sort of think of it with dread the day when that story would be read because the teacher would point me out at once oh that's her grandfather who wrote this and everyone would turn around to look at me so it was i it was a moment of pride for me but it was also a moment of dread i was a very shy child i was a pathologically shy child and then to have everyone notice you and you know maybe talk about you think about you so all that somehow made you stand apart and it was not something that i quite enjoyed inside i was very pleased that look my grandfather was so great that everyone knows about him and all that but it was his very largeness the very uh, you know his greatness outside the home that made him somehow out of reach for me i mean of course i read the stories firstly we were all went to an english medium school so hindi was not a language that one was reading on a regular basis of course one read the uh, textbook and all that but i actually came to reading hindi much later uh, i've also discussed this in that essay that i wrote uh, when my father was uh choosing stories for kahani and the, all these whole bunch of stories would come and you know he there were too many so he'd ask me also to sift through some of them so then i started reading hindi but hindi literature as such as far as premchand went i had not really read very much premchand when i was a child and also there was this feeling somehow that i'm related to him you somehow have inhaled his writing without having read it you know this this pe- very peculiar feeling so that was there too and then slowly of course i when one, one became aware of the writing and i read it much later in my college years and when this kahani thing happened and one was reading more comfortably in hindi and uh, i actually tutored myself to read in hindi and to write in hindi because 
I mean, it would have been so. When people used to ask me, even when I, my collection of Hindi stories had been published, that did you write them in Roman? How did you write them in Hindi? You know, so it was always this linguistic kind of migration that was happening all the time in me. I mean, I was thinking in Hindi or sometimes in English sometimes and, you know, the reading and the writing were crossing and the whole process of translation, for instance, also began as a sort of groping for language and which language is just to uh, find which language was I was the most comfortable in. And that process has never really changed. It's still the same. You know, I still fumble. I still fumble. I think maybe this will be better in English, that this will be better in Hindi. The knowledge of Urdu also complicated it a little bit because then there's Urdu also to be reckoned with, you know. So, I mean, it's all these, but I don't think of them as a disadvantage. Rather, they contributed to a kind of richness of voice. I think if you know other languages, they, they are always pushing up between beneath the language that you're writing in. So you get a sense of a larger sort of a linguistic culture when you're writing, say, in Hindi, for instance. I like to write in Hindi because things around me are happening in Hindi. You know, I mean, everything that's taking place is happening in Hindi. And uh, Hindi also has the advantage that you can lace it with things from other languages, like registers are important. For instance, if there's a, someone who's swearing or some vendors calling out, you know, jamun, you know, kali hai, dilwali hai, you know, little phrases like that, which are impossible to translate in English. So, and English already has a sort of middle class feel to it. I mean, it seems to me that middle class homes, you know, only people in middle class uh, homes mostly know English. And that is the world that they know. When, so when you write about a person walking on the street, they can't, you can't do street speak in Hindi, uh, sorry, in English, because the speech is actually much more colorful in the colloquial language. So English has that disadvantage. I mean, it has uh, sort of, the reach is not as great as uh, the regional languages, I think. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's a whole world that is closed, in a sense, to the writer in English, I feel. I mean, of course, people are writing, but uh, somehow, I mean, I feel that the languages can get that much better. Hindi, for instance, which is why I decided. And my father, of course, wanted me to write in Hindi. So that was also one reason why I started writing, started thinking about writing in Hindi. But there was this whole lot of other reasons, too. Yeah, I think you mentioned in your essay that your father had this belief that whatever is the language of your birth, your mother yes, tongue is yes, it, well, you yes, must write in it. Yes. Now, you, you know, Premchand once said that he, you know, wrote Hindi in the morning Urdu in the afternoon, stop quote, and he also used to take notes for his stories in English because it, it just seemed to lend itself to that, the, the kind of economy of the language, yeah. the precision of the language and all of that. And it just strikes me as someone who's only really good at one of these languages. The others, I uh, you know, other languages I understand, I speak, but English is the only one I've really thought deeply about and written in. And uh, it just strikes me that they're all fundamentally so different from each other that uh, there are things you can express in one that you just cannot express in the other, for example. So is it then the case that the language that you then choose to use at a particular moment is what is appropriate for that task. Like I imagine if you were writing, say, a business-like email to your bank, you would of course do it in English because you're just putting down a bunch of points. But if you want to capture the ambiance around your local panwala, you cannot capture that in English. You have to do that in Hindi. I just find that, you know, being multilingual myself, at least at a sense of speaking these languages, I, I, I feel that I'm more fortunate than people in the West who might only know one language because it's kind of richer uh, this way. So is that something you feel at all? And has there been like a process where you've come to peace with knowing that you have all these languages with all their different flavors for all their different uses and not have to think about this is my language? I don't know if uh, the question of which one is mine comes into it. Because, I mean, these are all the languages that compose the universe, universe that is around me. You know, and uh, when even if I'm, for instance, translating, uh, the language that I choose to translate in will also, even if it's English, it will have different registers from what I have absorbed from my surroundings. So all these languages compose the, the environment where I come from. So I don't really sort of think of it as this one is mine and this one is not, you know. It's just something that you have grown up with and something that has become part of you. So all these languages are part of uh, me. English is uh, something that I have read a lot in. Most of my reading, in fact, has been in English. 
this has also been an advantage in the sense that it uh, it has shaped my sensibility in a certain way and uh, when you read something and it it also kind of uh, hones a kind of critical register in you so when you read something else for instance in hindi and you know the horizons that are there uh, in western literature which is you know in many other languages uh which of course we get those in translation but even in translation i mean you can get a sense of all these other worlds that exist outside outside uh, india and uh, you sort of use that lens to look at what is around you what you are reading even in the languages what you are reading so you get a kind of critical faculty and your sen- sensibility has got shaped by the reading so reading has been very important for me i mean reading has been one of the primary things that i have done i mean i've been more of a reader rather than a writer i would say because i mean i've been reading from the age of what 5 or whatever it is i'm very young age and you know you sort of go through all these authors and you sort of pick up something and like when i was 8 years old i think i wrote my first story in english which i was uh, modeled on the enid blyton stories that i would uh, read and it was picked up by me arvind mehrotra and my cousins alok and amit uh, my who died later uh, he they were bringing out this uh, magazine called damn you it was <laughs> on the pattern of the new york uh, little magazine called fuck you so they named it damn you and uh, they were all a bunch of teenagers themselves then they were in university alabad university and they decided to sort of bring out this cyclo uh, cyclo style magazine so they used it in that because they were running out of material who's going to give the material to this bunch of teenagers so anyways they were looking for material at that point I mean, of course it became very famous later and now it's become part of this world sort of magazine thing you know so but at that point uh, so my story the early story in english was published in that uh, damn you so my journey in a sense started with english but then of course as it went along there was a huge gap in my writing it started at that age but then i wasn't writing very much for a, for many years and for all these reasons that i was groping for a language and just thinking and agonizing about how i was not being able to write and looking at the shape of my hands for instance or looking into my eyes in the mirror and think oh this looks like a writer but i could not somehow the writer and i could never meet you know it was like having a star crossed lover you know you <laughs> couldn't meet the writer and i were just you know away from each other So anyway so and in that time i came to this uh, there was this there's this word shabd which in hindi means sound and it also means a uh, word so this somehow created this bridge for me it was it came to my i mean i thought about it in that way that it's a bridge between the heard and the written you know because it's a sound also and it's a shabd is a word also so it's the written word so that somehow seemed very important to me at that point it became like it created a kind of bridge between the heard and the written uh, literature i mean there was this uh, language of sound i thought which had no meaning behind it for instance the whistle of an engine or the sound the chuck chuck sound of the pump i heard it in the uh, village where i went once or the sound of the bullock cart wheels grinding away on the road these are all sounds and it's a kind of language of sound but it leads to nothing else but the language of words leads somewhere else so i mean i don't know how uh, but it created this thing that there's something the writing can be auditory as well as you know uh, something that is written down so that was an important moment for me and gradually all these sort of all this thinking about language finally uh, led to my first story i think i was must have been in my early 40s something like that when i wrote the first story which was in hindi so that's how my writing career started and i started quite late i'm a slow writer also so you know so i have like three or four questions arising from here and one of them is this that you know you've spoken about how a lot of your early reading was english and it blight turn and then by the age of 13 you discover satra and all the russians mm. and catherine mansfield and so on and so forth now it strikes me that the different literatures different world literatures evolved in different ways to be something completely different and to have different sets of values uh, right like uh, for example uh, david rubin in in the world of premchand wrote about premchand himself he wrote quote to premchand belongs the distinction of creating the genre of the serious short story and the serious novel as well in both hindi and urdu virtually single handed he lifted fiction in those these languages from a quagmire of aimless romantic chronicles to a high level of realistic narrative compared 
available to European fiction of the time. And in both languages, he has, in addition, remained an unsurpassed master. And elsewhere, Sheldon Pollock kind of expressed a view that Premchand believed in social realism. And he kind of looked down on what he called the feminine quality, the tenderness and emotion of contemporary Bengali literature. Uh, and even at the level at which Premchand was writing that he's, you know, and I'm taking Ruben's words for it because I haven't read enough to come to my own judgment. But even at the level at which he is writing where he has lifted it to, to, to more serious, it is still very different from the European literature that you read. Like when I read your stories, for example, you're using details and actions a lot. So it's all show, don't tell in a sense. Whereas if I look at a story like your translation of Premchand's Idga, for example, the second last paragraph, when the grandmother realizes what the boy has done, and it's all tell. Premchand is just describing her emotions and the way she feels. Whereas a more modern writer, a more Western writer would show her doing something and, you know, with more economy, just through actions and a detail, bring out the same emotion in the reader. These are different values at play. And again, one doesn't want to make a value judgment on these different values. These are literatures evolving in different kinds of direction. So then the thing is that as someone whose sensibilities are shaped by Western literature, by, you know, the precision, the economy, the, the sort of... Um, all the values of Western literature, how, would you have to slip into a different mode while reading Hindi and Urdu literature? Uh, as far as Premchand goes, I mean, uh, the reason why he's doing this, uh, firstly, he's coming from a different time. Of course, of course. And yeah. uh, secondly, uh, Premchand was in a hurry. I mean, he had a mission. He is trying to change things. I mean, you know, he has this mission and so very often... Uh, he's writing at great speed and he died early and he's written so much. I don't think anyone in the world, I've been thinking about it. I don't think any writer in the world has probably written sort of so much. I mean, he's written short stories, he's written novels, he's written plays, he's written letters, he's written essays, he's written, done translations. I mean, he, there's a whole huge and range of what he's done, you know. So it's, it's. I mean, I'm constantly foxed by this. I mean, how can a man who is in ill health, he has poor health throughout, he dies at the age of 56. How has he managed to write so much? And he's like fired with some kind of creative uh, instinct that, and he has to change things. He just believes in change and he just writes and he's seen all these things around him. So he's writing about the reality, which is which is still pretty relevant actually, because nothing much has changed in the countryside. So he's writing and he's he's writing across a whole range of things. You know, he's also not just a social realist, I think. There are many stories that are not socially realist uh, stories. There's one tiny story. I don't know, we, uh, Arvind and I have translated that. In fact, we've been working on that project too, which is we've done about eight to ten stories. We want to do some more and then maybe find a publisher for them. So in that story, it's called uh, Darwaza in, in, in Hindi. And it's about a door and a little child. This man is sitting with a little child and this child is just looking and he's chasing a bird. He's doing this, that and the door is uh, open all the while. And uh, the child is not bothered about the door. And then suddenly somebody goes past on the road and he's selling sweetmeats or something he's selling and the child wants that. And this father who, who he's sitting with refuses to buy him that. So he gets into this temper and he... Uh, once he rushes to his mother or mother, but the door which has been open all this while has suddenly banged shut. And the child who so far had not been bothered with the door is now suddenly very anxious that the door is shut. So he starts crying and he runs to the, towards the door. And it's a very tiny story. It's about, I think, two pages or something like a very, very short story. So it's it's not about social realism at all. I mean, it's a very moving, very lovely story. And just a moment, he's caught this moment of this child. So he's written uh, a whole range of things, many other kinds of things also. And even if he sometimes uses, uh, he uses all sorts of devices to get his point across. So uh, I don't know whether it would be right to call him primarily, he is primarily a social realist, but there are other examples of stories that are no, fair Not enough. In that I, mode. I, I didn't mean the example as a criticism mm. of Premchand or anything of the sort. No, no. And, and we'll mm. discuss him more. But uh, I was just kind of leading to the question of how these different kinds of literatures, how does one look at them? Does one look at them with different lenses? My next question was also, for example, going to be about languages, which is a related question that languages also seem to have qualities of their own which lend themselves to a certain kind of expression so it's always seemed to me that say Urdu and Bengali are very expressionistic languages 
whereas languages like say japanese and korean are much more minimalistic and and you see that in the kind of literature that emerges from these uh, languages and english is in a kind of a middle ground so if you just do a direct translation say like a lot of translations of tagore for example and i'm half bengali so mm. i know a bit of bengali fail completely to me because they are gorgeous and beautiful in bengali but if you just try a literal yeah. translation it simply doesn't work because it just seems too overblown and purple mm. and all of that mm. so as someone who looks at literature and you know you've presumably then imbibed all the values of the western literature that you're reading how does one adjust one's lens like of course one adjusts it for context if someone like premchand is writing in the you know early 20th century there's you know there's only so much you can mm. expect the only so many influences that he was open to but apart from that you know how does one sort of uh, i think i think Uh, possibly we generalize too much about literatures i mean western literature is also hugely sort of different and indian literature sure, too is hugely different so to say that these are western values and we are trying to apply them to indian reality that also does not work i think because indian reality comes from a particular milieu i mean you are sort of so you have to look at it from sort of you base yourself in that milieu and then look at it so uh Uh, for instance a writer like vinod kumar shukl i mean where is he coming from i mean he is writing about these uh, small towns a uh, very ordinary day some man is walking down the street and some other man is observing him and he thinks oh this man went this way and he again he is going this way without having come back even once you know so there this absurd kind of quality to it and it gives a sort of space to uh, mil- very lower middle class lives that are normally one would think are very cramped and living in very sort of poor circumstances whatever but i mean he adds this kind of very sort of almost playful element to the whole thing so i mean he is one writer i mean there are so many writers who are writing different things even in uh, hindi or in bangla there be possibly many more i know because bangla is sort of very well developed literature malayalam as we have seen has so many different registers so it's very hard to say you know that we can train a particular kind of lens you know to look at these things you you just have to adapt to what is being written and where it's set and you know you judge it on its own ground you know it it happens like that i think and also this whole thing of languages being expressionist or minimalistic okay japanese one can say yes it is minimalistic but for instance urdu I think Urdu is so difficult to translate because I think it's one of the languages in which the form is the content. I mean, the way you say a thing is what it is. You know, it's just there's nothing else. So that form is very difficult to express in another language. It's a very light. It's a very weightless language, and and it has these very fine sentiments, a lot of subtlety. For instance, I was telling someone just the other day that there's this person I know. The son of my famous, I mean, the writer I'm very fond of, Nayyar Masood, whose book you have right here. I see. <laughs> yeah. So he's my absolute favorite in Urdu. So his son is called Timsal. So I wondered what Timsal meant. Then someone told me that it means a crack in a mirror. Wow. So I wondered where that came from. So I went into it a little bit and found out that this boy uh, is so beautiful that when he looks at himself in the mirror, the mirror cracks. so the subtlety of that thought you know ki you know a mirror can actually crack when someone is looking into it because it can't take the beauty you know so that's a thought that comes in a language like urdu i don't know which other french possibly i mean some language would would have to have a very fine kind of uh, it comes after years and years of you know thinking and feeling and a delicate sensibility so uh, there are, i mean examples in all the languages that prove the other example to be untrue so one can't really generalize is my whole take on this language Fair. thing i'm also struck by another thing you said about premchand is that he was a, a man in a hurry and obviously he wrote more than a dozen novels or 300 stories essays editorials letters plays biographies blah 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 all of all of that and actually one writer i can think of who's more prolific but obviously a complete outlier is a french writer jorge simenon who wrote some hmm. 400 novels yeah but he wrote only novels he wrote only novels yeah but if 400 of them is 400 novels and they are completely i would like quite a few of them are mystery stories i mean at least the ones that i have read a, a bunch of them are the, the maigre books obviously yeah the maigre but books but his, his serious stuff is huh. really good i mean i haven't I, actually read very much of uh, maigre i mean of simino except uh, these and i think one more of, of which is also very different but uh, i wouldn't put them in the same category sure 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 because I've, i mean and uh, i think of say for instance charles dickens or the major writers of the yeah. west dickens or uh, mopassa or you know people 
I mean, they've all written very fine stuff, but nobody has actually written such a lot. So much, so such much. a lot. And yeah. so Premchand is not just a writer, he's an influencer of that age. You know, he just he's forming that age. You know, he's like shaping the times. Yeah. The times are shaping him and he's shaping the times. And one of the reasons that you mentioned in that lovely essay at the start of that book, The History of Selected Stories, which you edited, is you speak about how he saw art as always having a purpose, his writing as having a purpose. And like in 1936, he gave this speech at the Progressive Writers Conference where he was a chairman, where which is called the aim of literature, mm. where he spoke about, yes. you know, how uh, these social aims mm. are so uh, uh, incredibly important in, you know, showing the lives of the underprivileged and exposing oppression and all of all of those things what do you sort of feel about that because milan kundera of course among so many others has written about how that the moment literature goes towards polemic or goes towards having a particular political purpose it ceases to be literature it ceases to be art and uh, in your own writing the very little of it that i've uh, read in english though i plan to uh, kind of read all of it uh, soon um in your own writing you show no signs of that your own writing show an interior life of the characters that they are and they do to me what um uh, you know i i think great art does is that it awakens something in me it captures a little bit of the human condition to use that uh, slightly pompous cliche uh, so what is your conception therefore of literature like people will often ask that like on the one hand i you know tell my writing students for example that be an indiscriminate reader if you enjoy reading something read it don't pass value judgment ki ye pulp book hai and ye serious uh, literature hai and all of that but at the same time you know there is literature and there is non literature it's very nebulous and i find it hard to kind of define that so what what would your uh, sense of that be like where does your sense grow like as a kid of course you're reading in this indiscriminately as all of us who grew up in india before a certain year did because books were so hard to get hold of we read everything we get but at what stage does do you begin to realize that this is something called literature and i want to do it and this is how it is different and uh, uh, do you feel that premchand's sort of having this sort of social objective as part of his work do you think it affects that in some way i think you know amit uh, i think it's uh, the literature is also very influenced by the age in which you are writing i mean he's writing at a time when firstly there is no literature in hindi which can be called serious literature right and then he's writing at a time of great social unrest he's sort of trying to you know um, sort of uh, oppose the british and, and he's trying to you know he has his literature has a purpose he wants to do something with that so he and he wants to write a lot he wants to you know hurry through it when you forward towards his mission so i think that changes the tone of the whole thing so it's a different sort of literature i wouldn't say that this is not literature and that is literature yeah. because milan kundera or somebody in the west i mean they have grown uh, out of the circumstances that they have uh, experienced so it it all uh, depends on that and also depends on what you're trying to do with it so he's he has a very definite purpose and i think it's very fine literature i mean he's uneven premchand is very uneven some of his things are much finer than others but on the whole i would say that he writes something that for the common man in india i mean you go anywhere everybody has read something of premchand so for him to touch some kind of deep chord in such a vast you know part of uh, indian society at any rate so there has to be something in it it can't just be ki nahi this is not literature there's something else that is finer this i mean this is a much later thing when you talk of kundera or talk of the writers of the west this is a later thing yeah. this whole development in this thing of writing how does it take place i mean the like writing itself becomes much more dense you're spending more time over it you're sort of thinking about things in a different way so it comes from there i think it's hard to compare the two i mean there's a uh, you know the situation is completely different right so l- let's get back to your growth in this period of time where you you grew up in this atmosphere you're reading a lot you're observing a lot though you said it's with uh, uh, you know just because uh, it's so dull but i i don't completely buy that but you're observing a lot you're growing a lot you want to write you've written that early story i think lucky hore is or something <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a copy of one of the enid blyton stories i'd been reading at the time so the title sounds very enid blyton yes <laughs> i mean it's not i don't ca- call it my first story actually it was a discovery that i could write rather than a story that i wrote i would put it like that i mean of course 
this was something unstated inside me that I would write, that I would be a writer. I mean, I never said it to myself, but I, somehow that knowledge was there because it was just something that one did. It was just something that one fell into, I would say, because everyone around me was writing in my entire family. My mother wrote, my grandmother wrote, my aunt wrote on both sides, my uncle wrote, my, his wife wrote. I mean, everybody was writing. So it was, it felt like this is something that one does, you know, this is what one will do. And uh, then I, when I started reading, it also sort of uh, sets off something with you. So at a point when I was reading and I was trying to decide which language to write in, and it came to me very late that I could actually write in both. And uh, also the reading set off this thing. I, I could be reading about something set in Paris or in New York or wherever, but somehow the story, the universal story was the same. So I just felt that all these stories are about me, you know, they are like about me. So it was a very peculiar realization at that point. You know, this was my journey of reading in my school days or college, early college days. So I would just spend days reading. There was nothing else to do. We did not have television and thank goodness we didn't, you know, we didn't have TV or any other screen to look at. So uh, you either read the world or you <laughs> world outside or you read your book, you know, so it was basically a choice between the two. And I did both. I mean, I looked around me, the house and the plants and the insects and whatever. So, I mean, the, this thing of nature became very strong in me. And plus reading all these other books that were set in different places, but I felt that they resonated with me. And they were all about me. And at some point, they generated the thought that perhaps I too can create a world of my own. Like these people have written, I can also write. You know, so it, I thought about these things when I was not writing. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I think about current times and I wonder how the sensory overload of the modern times affects us as people. Like if I was growing up today, I don't know if I'd become the kind of reader I did become. I read a lot as a kid. Uh, that's a habit I lost as an adult. But, you know, today you're surrounded with so many things. There's always YouTube, there's Instagram, and it's very fleeting. Like an observation that I think Jonathan Haidt once uh, made is that you would imagine that today, because of the internet, you have access to all the knowledge, all the art of ages past, which, you know, people like Mm, mm. But the counter to that is that what most people are consuming most of the time is something produced in the last three days. And that's it. Yeah. Whereas I think, you know, that you and I growing up, you know, a decade and a half apart, but whatever, a couple of decades apart, would still have lived in a time where you read whatever you could get, where you didn't have smartphones to look at all day and 300 television channels and so on. Now, while we were having lunch earlier, you know, uh, I told you an anecdote and then you told me about the short story that you read that you remembered vividly. And I, I said, think it's called Jealousy. I'm not very sure, but I think Proust. it's called Jealousy. Yeah. Possibly. Great. I'll, I'll look it up <laughs> and link it in the show notes if it's available uh, anywhere. Uh, yeah, but please check the title because I don't remember it so well. I think it's, it's called Jealousy, if I seem to remember. I'll do that. So whatever we, whatever oh, I'll, I'll get Proust back home and, and tell you what it is because I probably have the book somewhere on my Kindle, I think. Ah, okay. <laughs> so uh, so my question here is, is that even I find sometimes that things I remember really vividly in terms mm. of uh, books that I have read or stories that I have read or... Uh, uh, you know, movies that I have seen are things that I saw at a particular phase in life where I won't remember something I saw five years ago so vividly, but something that I saw when I was 15 or 20, uh, I'll still remember, even if it didn't move me so hard then. It, it's something that I'll still kind of uh, remember. Like recently I was like chatting with a friend and I suddenly remembered this uh, and I, I'd read all the Russians when I was a kid and I remember this very powerful story which didn't strike me so hard at the time but I suddenly remembered it and I was like wow by Leonard Andreev called The Abyss which if I remember correctly and now I'm remembering from memory is about a guy who goes on this hike with a bunch of friends uh, they find a girl and they rape her and they kill her but he doesn't participate and then later on he goes back alone and he has sex with the dead body and that's a whole story and it's a okay. very interior kind of yeah, story yeah, you know these yeah. bare details don't suffice yeah. and it's it's such a sort of uh, powerful memory mm. even though mm. at the time I kind of didn't notice it who were the writers who sort of that well I mean your uh, so recounting this story actually put me in mind of another one which is fairly not very similar but fairly similar I mean like there's this uh, it's by Raymond Carver mm. and uh, it's called I think so much water so close to home have you read that story? I definitely have, but I don't remember the specific story, but I'm a big yeah. Carver fan. I think it's yeah. one of the stories Robert Altman also made in his yeah. film Shortcuts. Yes, he did. Yeah, Shortcuts. Yeah. So this one, this group of friends, I think three or four of them have gone out for a picnic or they've gone out for an outing, fishing, I think. And uh, when they are sitting there, uh, they see that there's a dead body which is 
uh, sort of stuck on a plant on a tree somewhere there and they look at it and they wonder who it could be it's a woman you know clothing torn and all that she's just there and they wonder who it uh, could be but they don't give much attention to it and they carry on with their fishing and their little picnic and all that and they spend the time that they were there for and they go home and then this guy tells his wife that there was this woman that they found on the a tree over there so this wife she's completely stunned by what these people how they could still you know gone have gone on fishing and with this woman there and she begins to doubt the kind of person and she begins to think that what if they have killed this girl or if he has killed the girl you know so all sorts of doubts get created in her mind and i think uh, this story goes on like that and then there's too much that that thing comes between them and it sort of splits them up i think it ends like that that they split up or i mean i don't remember the and they seem to forget endings that's it's something like that i think they probably split up or there's certainly a great coldness between them after that incident but of course i mean it's it's got a similar theme of yeah 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 you know uh kava is great at that you know he's just so i mean so he writes in so few words and yeah, he just yeah. puts it across like you know it just gets straight to you yeah. and there's a wonderful poem by him uh, which is called i think uh, limits limits have you read i haven't read uh, limits so limits is this poem his poems are also like his short stories because his short stories are like poems they are short <laughs> yeah. and the poems are long this one certainly is longish and it's like a short story so in this uh, these people have gone out duck shooting and these two friends have gone duck shooting and they're shooting and shooting and they're killing and all the ducks falling around them and they are they still have so much shooting left in them but they get you know they want to meal they are hungry so they go to this farm which is there and uh, there the farmer has uh, this barrel in which he has it's a goose actually they are not ducks but they ge- they are geese so this uh, farmer has got a goose in that thing and the, he, the goose can't get out and it's just being given food and it's just stuck there it just stays there always and it's a great decoy for the uh, other geese to come and uh, they just think he, then the, these geese come and they get a good shot and all that so but this uh, sight of that goose gets him thinking this person who's writing the story the narrator and he thinks of limits that if a person can be limited in that world and it can live it can survive you know then then you can survive anything you can just you know so it's so beautifully done that poem you know that it's just about the limits of human endurance or the limits of endurance that can also become human endurance so that duck a goose becomes a metaphor for endurance so i found it wonderful that poem so it's i mean it just stayed with me because i just affected me very deeply when i read it yeah kavar is great i mean cathedral is a particular favorite and uh, the interesting thing about kavar is that some, some of the credit for his short stories during that golden period uh, you know mm. what we talk about when we talk about love mm. and yeah. uh, cathedral and that whole period is given to his editor at esquire gordon lish if mm. i remember correctly yeah. who was apparently a great editor and would really cut cut them down yeah, and make yeah. them sparse yeah. and cover after he split from lish couldn't quite repeat mm. that same kind of uh, yeah. magic which is also yeah but apparently i mean the stories are there because of uh, his editor i mean these uh, uh, stories originally written by cover are just not like that at all so in a yeah. sense half the credit goes to the editor also Yeah, for yeah. this whole thing that cover is known for is you know brevity and all that so actually that is the editor doing that because his own stories apparently were not as short and sort of yeah. pithy as they are now and in a sense that also speaks to the art versus artist debate where in this case the art is just standing on its own anyway hmm. you know what is hmm. cover but a name yeah. you know yeah. who cares yeah. if shakespeare wrote shakespeare's plays yeah exactly uh, yeah who cares yeah yeah so uh, the question i was uh, coming at was who are the writers who Uh, affected you greatly when you were a child i won't say influence because one really never knows somebody's influence for a long time yeah. it's all subterranean but yeah. uh, who were the writers you really liked then or was there ever a period of time where you read someone and you said i want to write like this person or this is so well, amazing well uh, childhood i mean there were of course many of these books at home that i read without understanding them you know there were all these like you said jean paul sartre and people like that i mean who one could not make sense of at that time but one felt good that one had read them yeah and then of course i discovered the russians chekhov chekhov is a particular favorite and uh, then as i grew older that kafka became a great favorite of mine i i loved kafka completely you know just i used to search out books i used to there was uh, in the library at college there was this a uh, picture book of kafka's prague i used to sit somewhere in the behind the shelves and just to pour over it and you know just Hours and hours of Kafka. So he was one of my favorite writers at that point, and I think he, I, 
may have tried to copy him. I mean, I certainly put on that stance, which I wrote about in my essay, that this despairing stance, you know, Kafka, and, which was completely absurd in my situation. But, I mean, one tries to emulate some people that one begins to admire. So Kafka was one of those writers. And then, of course, there were many people I read. It's very hard to read. I became very fond of W.G. Sebald at one place. Uh, Sebald, Zebald, I don't know how you pronounce it. Zebald, Sebald, I think. Or Sebald, whatever. Yeah, I don't know, so yeah. anyway, I became very fond of him. And this was also because I came across his books when I was in Norwich. I went there on a, a residency at the University of East Anglia. And uh, my room had this whole collection of Zebalds displayed there because he had actually taught in that at that university and he had died just the year before. So... I came upon him and I just loved the way he wrote. I mean, it was very kind of textured writing. And, uh, and using photographs and all that as well. Using photographs very as well. Ways. Yes, very. And uh, he's sort of, uh, the way he could encapsulate a whole civilization in a walk. I mean, like he's walking, I think the book is uh, Rings of Saturn, I think it is. And in which he's taking a walk along the... I haven't read that one. Uh, East Anglia coast and how he's, the thoughts in his head and how entire civilizations are covered during that walk. So it's that, this whole, the largeness of his uh, concepts. And uh, the same thing I came upon uh, in a very different way in Proust also. Like the, he's describing a woman's sleeve, the sleeve of a dress, which is sort of very loose and big. And how he describes the sleeve, he just sentence goes on for pages and pages as Proust often tends to do. And... Uh, he starts somewhere and he ends up somewhere completely different. So, and in the middle, he's covered this entire lifetime and entire sort of, you know, whole gamut of things. He's just covered in that one description of a dress, you know. So, it's, it was fascinating to me how these things uh, can, you know, they can be done like this. This kind of, and it's not written in a particularly experimental style or anything. This is the way his thoughts have gone. And I realized that writing is actually just just what it is, a way of thinking. You know, you think like that, so you write like that, you know. So There are no limits as cover. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no limits, absolutely. So these these have been some of my favorites. And of course, then Urdu Nayar Masood, who's staring me in the face right here. Yeah. Uh, I'm really fond of him. In fact, I was thinking of translating him also. And I went and met him once and he was very uh, keen that yeah, but he was uh, he all, he wanted his stories more in uh, Hindi rather than English because English already had been done by uh, Umar Meman, who's his great friend and editor in America. So he was very keen that they should come out in the Hindi script because people here couldn't read his Urdu. So I thought of doing that too, but then I mean I even took along a contract. Harper Collins had given me a contract to go and get it signed. He said, "Oh, you just put what you like in it and sign it." But as it turned out, it was a very daunting task because his stories are very difficult. I don't know if you've read any uh, Nayar Masood or... I mean, not in the original, obviously. Yeah, so because he's he's very, very... Uh, in fact, a bit Kafkaesque. Maybe that's why it appealed to me in the first place. But, but his uh, thoughts are very, very... Uh, like a distillation. I mean, there's something going on in... The, and, and they are always set in these very sort of lower class Muslim localities and the kind of things he describes are almost read like magic realism because we don't know that world. You know, so that and his thoughts and very, very subtle, like there's this story called uh, Essence of Camphor, which is the uh, Itre, Ka, Itre uh, Kafur, it's called in Urdu. And it's about the whole process of making perfume and how the vapors rise from it. And, you know, it's just he describes very kind of abstract things and he links them up with something completely different. So he has this wonderful feel. So Nayar Masood was also one of the people I was reading. And uh, Isma Chuktai, uh, in the Urdu writers, Isma Chuktai is fantastic. She's, she's very nice. And uh, we also have uh, like Alok, my cousin, and Francesca. I don't know if you know Francesca Orsini. I mean, she's also a close friend. So when she comes, so three of us form an Urdu reading group. Wow. So we pick up these. And Francesca usually brings something nice along from England. And uh, then we sit together and we read these Urdu texts. So one of the things we read was Umrao Janada, and I did not know how, what a wonderful book it is. You know, it's just absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's set in that time, 1857. It captures the events of that era and this, and it's so, uh, I mean, it moves so quickly. And so that was one of the things we read. And these are the Urdu books I'm talking of. Then Hindi, of course, my favorites have been uh, Vinod Kumar Shukl and uh, Jyotsna Milan. I don't know if you've read her, but she's, she's a fine writer. My friend also. She was my friend who died a few years ago, sadly. So she's there. Hindi also, there's, there's enough to read. 
you know there's plenty to read in hindi and in urdu of course this is sort of the other thought that strikes me and it struck struck me a lot over the last um, Three or four years, because before that, for most of my life, I've assumed that hey, it's a globalized world. It's open. There is mm. an internet. Everybody can read everything. Everything is open to me in a mm. sense. It's accessible to me. And I've realized recently that that that's not true. It's it's an illusion that English speaking elites can sometimes have, because they think that you know English is the center of the universe and mm. we've got everything. And mm. uh, you know, in past episodes, I've realized that there is you know, for example, just moving for a moment to politics, I've understood that. Uh, Ram Guha had written this excellent essay about uh, how there are no right-wing intellectuals in India, and that's something I broadly believed in. I thought that mm. everything that you see from the right is bigotry, which is cloaked up in a kind of yeah. pseudo intellectualism. Mm. Mm. Uh, but I have since kind of been convinced by friends who've been on this show. who've done their reading in hindi and other languages that there is an intellectual tradition one may disagree with it strongly but there is a coherent intellectual hmm. tradition of ideas which english speakers are kind of missing out and sort of moving back to literature i had that same sense where i was trying to read things by you and i read a couple of some of your essays and a couple of stories in the, the magazine pratilipi which i'll link to from the show notes which i absolutely loved and i'd also like to discuss but nothing else i mean mm. everything else is in hindi and i can read in hindi and i intend to start reading more in hindi anyway so i mm. will get down to reading them but that world is close to me you know when yeah. some, when someone sits yeah. there and they talk about writers who write in english and have you read so and so and have you read so and so and i've generally mm. read them yeah. you know uh, I, i've read sebald i've read cover mm. i've read all these people but i haven't read the other names that yeah. you took in the yeah. other languages yeah. it's like that world is completely close to me now my question is is that world in a sense then lost or is there hope because uh, you know how do we kind of breach that more or more more and more what you have is sort of a homogenization of cultures and societies and economies like even in english uh, snigdha poonam the journalist had been on the show before she's written a book called dreamers where she writes about how in small towns there is this craze for everyone to learn english at first just at a functional yes. level yes. but there is this kind of craze and also there is this kind of snobbery the reverse of what you probably mm. felt at home where people are embarrassed to talk in their vernacular yes. in their specific yes. you know i had a question from uh, a friend of mine who had done my writing course where he said that he writes in kannada but he writes in a particular dialect of kannada not the mainstream mm. thing mm. so he's saying that should i write in that because that's what comes most naturally or should i try to write in proper uh, kannada mm. and it's a I don't know how to answer that because part of me says that no, you got to be authentic to yourself and mm. write in that dialect where everything yeah. is coming naturally to you. It's authentic, mm. but you also want to be read, and maybe that's a dying language. Yeah, is is this something that you kind of think uh, about? Well, I have thought about it quite a lot actually, but I think it's something to do with our education system. I mean, like we are not taught any of our own texts, you know, Sanskrit or Farsi or Urdu or whatever. We are not taught at the school level we should have something like that. And the texts that they do prescribe in Hindi for instance is one language that they do have texts in. But they are so boring. They are so utterly boring. Which child will read, you know, Jago Mohan Pyare or something like I mean, you know, one of those yeah. things. Why will they read all these moralistic and weird sort of uh, narratives or like uh, lives of patriots or things like that? who will read those i mean you have to have interesting material for children to start with i mean you are doing the language a service if you have something interesting and they could have sanskrit texts you know there's so much erotic literature in sanskrit for instance there's so much poetry there's so much nature writing the kalidas i think of kalidas and megdutam and you know things like that we we are completely cut off from that all because of i think our education system which is all skewed and it is very heavily uh, weighted in favor of english and uh, the lower middle classes who do not have access to that education are still reading very widely in uh, the languages in hindi like when i uh, when i started writing in hindi i used to get so much so many letters from everywhere i got a letter from goa jail i remember people are reading these things and they are probably not buying their own books but they are uh, circulating the same books so much is being read i think it's a problem of the middle class rather than other uh, classes and middle class is a small class but still it's the most powerful class and english is perceived as the language of success or power or whatever you know english so the whole world becomes open to you so i don't blame these people i mean it's just i think we should introduce some of these nice uh, texts in at the school level 
so that people don't grow away from their languages. I mean, they behave as if English, Hindi is a foreign language. You know, they behave as if they are sort of native speakers of English and Hindi has somehow come in and this is some foreign language that they have to learn. So the education system, I think, has to be uh, overhauled in a very big way for people to develop an interest in. I mean, it's not the same situation for Marathi or Bangla or Malayalam. I mean, people are, you know, doing work. They are sort of being read. I mean, it's not the same. It's the northern India, the Hindi belt, I would say. Delhi, UP, you know, all these places where English is gains primacy for other reasons, I think, than literary. So it's just, I think it can be fixed if, I don't know, I mean, if they'll have to re really sort of do a hack job, hack it job, hatchet job, whatever you call it, hatchet job with uh, the education system and overhaul it completely. I have no hopes of uh, top-down interventions working or even the education system necessarily changing this. I'm more interested in how things happen in a bottom-up way through the culture and all that. And there's an interesting sort of anecdote you mentioned in your essay in the Premchand book where you talk about how you went uh, to the village where he was born for his 125th anniversary in 2006. Yes. And uh, while you were waiting for things to happen and all of that, you noticed that there were so many people sitting around everywhere, you know, and, um, under shelter, not under shelter, sitting on the ground, just waiting for this whole thing to happen. And at that point, your musing is that, okay, I know why I am here, but why are these people here? And mm. you pointed out how some of them, ob obviously many of them must be Premchand readers and, and some mm. of them could in fact be characters out of his stories, as mm. you said. And that struck me as, again, something interesting to explore because I think there was a time in our culture where individual figures could play that kind of a very profound part in people's lives, where people are reading a writer, in this case, Premchand, mm. and finding so much to identify with that, uh, you know, it becomes something that is important for them. And what has happened in modern times, I think, and, and tell me what you feel about this, is that in my view, what has happened is that this kind of thing is becoming less and less possible in the sense that, one, there is a lot more art and many more artists, which is a good thing. But also, whatever experiences we are having are very fragmented, in a sense. So it won't just be one writer who moves me with his five books. It'll be many, many writers whose snippets I'll read on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, which will have an effect on me. And the whole sort of thing kind of gets broken down, leading me to wonder whether another Premchand is even possible today, or maybe... Another Premchand is possible in a new medium like vlogs or, uh, you know, um, uh, Instagram, for example. I mean, mm. uh, what would an Instagram Premchand look like? I can't imagine. <laughs> uh, maybe like the Humans of New York uh, blog that uh, took off a few years ago, but I'm just thinking aloud. Mm. So what's your thought on the changing nature of the role that writers play within a culture? Or I'll say I, in a general sense, I'll say artists or creators, whatever term you'd like to use, mm. the role that they play within a culture and is that diminishing partly because there is less dullness people have so much to do in their lives mm. that mm. they don't have to read it's no longer the one entertaining thing that there is for them there is so much else to do what's your sense of this well i think as far as uh, i mean you mentioned all those people who had come for prem uh, that ceremony that they had uh, but th that had also something to do with the fact that prem actually established the common man as a valid character in literature. Before that, the stories were not about the common man and people could not identify with those. And these people are almost, its they are vindicated in some sense that they have been, their existence had been noticed. Their lives are worthy of being written about. You know, so it's, it's a moral value that he brings to those writings. So, and this question also ties up with the later one that you asked about uh, writers, uh, what can, you know, who can replace Premchand, that kind of thing. But I think it's a moral universe. The moral universe has completely, radically changed. And uh, the role of the writer has also changed correspondingly. The role of the writer, the image of the writer has also undergone a sea change because of that. You know, I mean, earlier writers, like we perceived the writer as someone who's, you know, hiding away in some corner, scribbling his things. And, you know, he's committed, he lives in poverty, he lives, you know, hand to mouth, very much like the figure Premchand is. And he's like that. And now, but now that has changed. Writers are no longer like that. Writers like to be seen. I mean, you see them everywhere. You see them at literary festivals. You see them when you get a prize for a prize ceremony. I mean, everyone is visible. There's so many cameras. There's so many lights. There's so much, you know, flashing thing going on. You know, writers are much more in the limelight. 
But uh, in a sense, I mean, I I'm, I'm, know I'm making this horrible generalization, but it's like uh, people are becoming clones. You know, very kind of many books that you read feel very much like the other book. You know, there's not much. It's because there's a lot of emptiness, I think, in books that are being written because they're being written in a hurry. They're being written for a particular reason. They are being written maybe because they can get a prize or maybe they can be published. So they are being, I don't really understand the need for this kind of frothy writing. And creative schools, creative writing schools, I think, have maybe contributed to this, to a certain kind of writing, which is the same for everyone. You know, they have this smart writing, which comes from there. You learn how to show, not tell is the typical phrase that is used now in the West. So that, on describing things, and, but you, sometimes you are, you search for a single insight in a book. You don't find it. You know, they have lots of descriptions, very authentic stuff, and they're very much related to what is going on outside in the society. But somehow it just lacks that spark because they don't give any original insight. You know, many books, of course, there'll be many exceptions to this too. But this is what I have found, that there's a certain sameness to the writing that's happening. And maybe it's because of the hurry or because, I mean, everyone is absorbing similar stuff around and uh, writing in English definitely can only come from a certain class because a lower middle class person is never going to write in English. So it, it reflects that class background too. So, well, that's, I think... It strikes me that there are really two kinds of writers and, and one kind of writer is in love with the notion of being a writer, yes, everything yes. that it involves. I will write these kind of serious literary mm. books and I'll get long listed for the booker and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I think the kind of writers I end up liking are just writers who just want to write. And mm. therefore, there is less artifice in that. There is, you know, it's not contrived. They're yeah. not trying to write a particular kind of book, which is in vogue. Mm. I, I want to sort of double click on a phrase that you used at the start of your uh, answer, which was moral universe, where you pointed out that the moral universe has changed and therefore mm. so has a writer within it. What do you mean by that? Well, moral universe, I suppose I mean that the world is much more complex now and it's not so easy to chart out a course in which... Uh, you, uh, in which you can know which is what is the right thing to do you know i mean there's nothing really it's it's in a sense much much more fragmented than the times that premson lived in i mean when there was a definite goal that we were trying to achieve independence and the you know uh, stopping the oppression of the farmers of the poor uh, people so all that has changed and uh, i mean i presume we are talking only of english writing in english just now Whatever sense you meant that in when you spoke of moral yeah, universe. Yeah, moral universe is, I think, just this, you know, just the whole urban mess that we live in. It's very, very fragmented, very diverse. There's too much happening. There's not enough direction, you know. So it's it's a very confused world. So, I mean, to find something of value is can be a struggle in this kind of world. And I'm not sure that every many writers are up to it, you know. I don't know. I can't give you concrete examples just now, but I have, my feeling is that there is nothing that we are striving for as such. You, you mean in an individual sense, a social sense? In an sense? individual sense. In an individual sense, there's not what is... Uh, one has to have some kind of uh, thing that one is trying to achieve when you're uh, writing a book. Yeah, in the in the sense that you mean that Premchand very clearly did in terms of the social messaging yes, and yes, times are Yes, social messaging, and... he's trying to reach some uh, thing. He's trying to you know, mm. anti-colonial, fighting colonialism, fighting whatever, you know, so all that stuff is gone. So now we have this, of course, there's much fine writing happening even now, as we have recently discovered, but there's, uh, there's much more writing going on and I'm not sure that all of it will, is worth the read. I, I think uh, like that. I'm just thinking aloud. Another way of thinking of that is there's something called Sturgeon's Law, which basically, it was first, I think, um, meant for science fiction, but it applies to everything eventually. And Sturgeon's law is that 95% of everything is scrap. 
<laughs> right, that's Trojan's law. Yes, yeah. And what happens sometimes is that we look at the past and there's some selection bias creeping in because obviously what we remember of the past is all the good stuff, mm. the highlights. Yeah. But when we look at the present, it's all 100% that is out there. Mm. So it seems like, oh, those were golden times, but these are not. And I think that one, there must have been as much crap back then. Yes. And two, a lot of the crap wouldn't have got published because it was so much harder to get published mm. in terms of gatekeepers. Mm. Mm. While uh, today, without uh, reference to... Uh, uh, anything that we might have gone through in the recent past in terms of the reading we've done without reference to that. I think mm. publishers are a lot more indiscriminate in that mm. they'll put out anything. Yeah. And in a sense, that's a good thing that the barriers of publishing yeah. are much lower. But, you know, so therefore you will simply have more of the crap yeah. And that 5% just seems mm. to be so little mm. and swimming mm. in that sea and yeah. uh, a lot of it lost to people like me because I might be restricted to reading one language or a particular kind. So yeah. I, I, never, I yeah. never discovered yeah. that, right? Yeah. And we also we also don't have uh, the advantage of time. I mean, like uh, if we were to look at the same stuff, say, 50 years down the line, we would uh, probably the good names or whatever names that we remember now from the past, the similar names would have cropped up then, but we don't have the advantage of that. Because yeah. we don't know. That will only show itself with time. The classics or whatever you call them. You know, the good books of this time will only pop up, you know, later. So how do we... Uh, I mean, who has withstood the stand of time? So we'll, we can't find that out now, you know. So in, in the interest of following the digressive nature of this podcast, a thought that just comes to mind and I'll throw it at you. I was watching this uh, vlog by this uh, fantastic musician called Rick Beato. He's mm. a 59-year-old guy. He does this thing on YouTube where he'll talk about music or he has a series which is called mm. What Makes a Song Great, where he'll break down a three-minute song and yeah. talk about different aspects of that. One of his recent videos was this complete rant where he completely lost it because he came across an article this guy had written where this guy said that, uh, you know, Paul Simon will not be remembered 200 years from now. <laughs> and he was saying that, listen, let me tell you something. The people who will be remembered 200 years from now, we may not have heard of them today. <laughs> and he gave the example of Johann Sebastian Bach, mm. uh, the classical yeah, uh, yeah. composer, talking about how in his own lifetime, he wasn't a particularly big deal. Mm. After his death, there was a kind of a bark uh, reclamation or something. I forget there's a term for it. But that made him the legend that we think of him today as. Yeah. But in his own lifetime, he was completely obscure. And that seems a fascinating thought to me that someone who is a great artist today, maybe somebody we haven't even heard of. Yeah. But 200 years later is regarded yeah. that way. Not that it necessarily makes a difference to an artist how he is regarded 200 yeah. years later. Yeah. He wants it now. Yeah. And the other thing is also the role of happenstance in getting noticed. Mm. Like someone recently put up this long thread about uh, Billy Joel, that when Billy Joel's first album Piano Man came out, it was completely unnoticed. It wasn't selling anywhere. Radio stations weren't playing yeah. it. It was basically lost. And the music company decided not to do anything with it. Mm. And they were washing their hands off. Mm. But there was one listener who felt passionate about it, who happened to have a copy. And he went to radio station after radio station after radio station mm. trying to make them play it. And eventually did a quid pro quo with the radio station RJ and made him play yeah. it. And then it became the sensation that it was. Yeah. And uh, Billy Joel would probably have gone back to his day job mm. if that hadn't taken yeah. off. Yeah. So the role of happenstance yeah, is absolutely. so incredible. Absolutely. And I think yeah, that's, I mean, somebody should do a separate project on this, uh, the making of a legend. Uh, how do legends get made? Yeah. Because, I mean, if you go into individual lives, I mean, what is it that has brought them to the fore? I mean, to a layman, a lay person like me, one song or one piece of music would perhaps sound very much similar to the, the other one. But I mean, there's something about that one that is better than this one. And of course, how does how does it happen that some some people get noticed and some don't? There's so much fine writing around, but only some gets noticed. No, and it's not even that the fine writing gets noticed and the non-fine doesn't. Uh, like, I think there was this uh, social science experiment a few years ago where people gave a whole, the, the subjects in the experiment, these apps, hmm. which have, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it. So obviously the mechanism was slightly different, but in principle hmm. it's like this, where all these people were given an app with like uh, 2000 songs or whatever, and they had to listen to whatever yeah. they wanted over a period yeah. of time, except that uh, in uh, some of them were shown a chart of what is popular and what is not. And they were all shown different charts. Mm. And in these different mini universes of these users that they built, different songs rose to the top or went down, just depending on pure happenstance. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, five people could accidentally listen to something and like it and not have noticed something else. Mm. And suddenly, mm. just by those five people liking it, yeah. the algorithms take yeah. over and yeah. that goes to yeah. the top. 
Yeah. So, so much. Yeah. So it's all a bit of an accident, really. I mean, everything's <laughs> an accident. <laughs> so let's go back more to uh, the accident of life itself, in particular yours. So you know, you're a prolific reader. You've written this story, Lucky Horace, at the age of eight, <laughs> and gotten published. And then you next write when you're late thirties, forties, whatever, yeah. uh, much decades yeah. or pass yeah. almost. Yeah. What's happening during this period of time, and also what is your conception of yourself, and how is it changing? Because you've said that even if you didn't articulate it to yourself, you felt that there was a writer inside yeah. you. It was natural. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the young Sarah Rai, for example. What did you see yourself as, and so on? Well, at that point, I mean, I don't know if I was having any very clear thoughts about. what i am or what what where i'm headed or what i'm going to do it was all like uh, um experiencing things as they came along i mean uh, when as far as literary pursuit goes i think my first experiment uh, apart from that story was uh, i also wrote a few horrible poems which i have completely i've hidden them away and i've thrown them and nobody has seen them so that little thing happened and uh, then after that i suppose translation was the next thing that i tried to uh, bring my hand to and it started with i think premchand story first story that translated was bade bhai sahab or one of those stories years back i mean when i may have been in my 20s early 20s something like that so it's been a long process of groping about for a language that i could write in and the translation was also a part of that you know because translation and uh, uh, fiction or your own writing comes from the same place i mean it's the same storehouse of words that you have inside you so in one you are trying to fish out from that storehouse and ex- extend it by translations which are uh, someone someone else's work but you become they become intimate for you because you have been uh, interacting with them so closely and the other is your own writing and the pool the translated stuff is also expanding your own uh, vocabulary your own thoughts your you are getting ideas i mean like someone else's voice that is allowing your own voice to come out you know you get i mean that happens a lot with reading as well i mean when you read something and you feel oh this is something that i have something like this in my own life so you begin to write something which has been set off a spark has been set off by something else so this uh, i see it as i mean what i have called it i think somewhere is uh, your life is a, a sort of series of organic moments like when you feel lit up by something you see something you experience something and you feel that there's something special about that moment and it you get a kind of uh, lit up is the word i can think for it so that is somewhere being stored inside you and when you're writing those moments fall together somehow and they come out and then the style also depends on what you're writing so the style will be geared to that and uh, the language too will be geared to that like if i'm writing the atmospheres say if i'm writing about a muslim family like my story which is called bhul bhulaiya it's uh, the labyrinth which is set inside this uh, it's in banaras so it's a very old town and there's this very old house in it and a very old woman living inside that house and uh, so the, it's a whole thing of labyrinth various kinds of labyrinths like the town itself is a labyrinth because of all those gullies and all those little by lanes and you know it's a very complicated sort of uh, map geographical map of the city and the house which is also very old is about 2 or 300 years old this is actually my mother's home as it used to be and uh, that is also a very big house with many rooms many sort of courtyards and passages and it goes back it has a i've written about that too in the autobiographical essays so it's that house and there's this old woman who's dwelling on her memories so she's caught in the labyrinth of her memories so it's a very kind of interactive sort of labyrinth which is town and house and old woman with her years and so it uh, i developed a style for writing that which is not a linear style but it's like a shell i mean it goes round you know uh, you she has she remembers the past and then she's in the present so it's all structured like that so uh the structure of a story and also the uh, style the language is also dictated by the material uh that's what i started out saying and in the meantime i've forgotten your question <laughs> i have also forgotten it because i got lost in my 
answer <laughs> so let, let let me move on to kind of quoting you on the writing process because this was such a lovely passage and i think all my listeners will really enjoy it again from your essay where you wrote quote it took me a long time to realize that the process of writing begins much before one has put anything down that one has so to speak always been writing it was while chasing butterflies in the garden as a child or watching a tortoise shell cat slink away into a dark alley that the writing has taken place like an invisible letter written with lime juice that only shows up when a hot iron is put to it the impressions that have been written onto the memory all the while that life is being lived are revealed in the catalyzing moment where pen meets paper the city buried underground and long forgotten about is chanced upon and not without a shock of surprise so it was that years after the house of my childhood had slipped into oblivion uh, i found my myself writing stop quote and i'm fascinated by what you also said about the act of translation because the act of translation is obviously an act of creation itself because in one sense you know any language must be impossible to actually translate into another like you said of uh, urdu so while translating did it help that you were looking closely at both the languages the language that you're translating from and the language that you're translating into i would imagine that that act of mindfully looking at each sentence and figuring out, out how to get something across that act of mindfulness itself shapes your own writing and then does that to take a step further shape the way that you look at the world around you you know like if you see proust for example going into these deep observations and just going you know does that sort of shape the next time that you are going into uh, your description of a particular thing do you feel that translation therefore played an important part in you know helping you find your voice as it were well actually to uh, uh, put it in a very broad sense i think even when you're writing your own fiction you're translating because you have seen the world and seeing the world and absorbing it is itself an act of translation i mean you are you are seeing visuals around you you're not seeing it in words but to put that world in words is already an act of translation so in that sense uh, a fiction writer is always a translator and that can be said for any uh, medium of art i suppose i mean poetry or uh, fiction or whatever you know that it's the same thing i mean you're seeing something and you're in your head the pictures are being formed into words and those words are then formed into sentences and then you are sort of working on those sentences and even those sentences when you are translating them into say english then you are your english is also going to be changed by the way you have uh, been brought up you, the kind of social class that you belong to where you have grown up the regional and the cultural parameters of that would affect uh, the way you write english also so there are many factors that go into it and it's a constant process of the, which is ongoing you know you, you there's nothing that you can say yeah, i look at this sentence and i think i wonder how to translate it it's not like that really for me i mean a translator has to look beyond the text you know you have to sort of absorb the text that you have read and then you have to because very often a sentence to sentence translation will absolutely not work so you have to uh, get somehow creatively transmit what you have read and even if it's not exactly what you read it's a kind of uh, you know distillation of what you have found in the original text and uh, you are going to uh, describe it in your own words so so i think translation is more in a more uh, thing of absorption you have to absorb it in a in a particular way and you have to get a sense of the language that you're translating from and the language you're translating into because the uh, the way both languages are structured is very different so one thing may work in this language and it may not work in the other language you know so it's you just have to have a kind of i suppose you have to look at it in a particular way to be able to get it right or there's no question of right or wrong but i mean to make it work i mean it has to you there are many factors that are at work also you know earlier you spoke about how literature is so sort of dependent on the context of the times and the circumstances and all that and somewhere you've written about how just being a woman closed you off to a set of experiences like you can't go walking the streets of your city at after midnight and you uh, you know there are certain experiences you just won't have that if you go to a panwala and you're just hanging out mm. everyone else is conscious that there's a woman there and uh, mm. therefore they are behaving differently so there is a limit to what experience is are open to you how has your sort of way of seeing the world evolved over a period of time in the sense that just speaking as a man it strikes me that there is a layer of social interaction that was completely invisible to me till a few years ago which is 
uh, really that extra layer of awareness that women have to carry with them mm. you know as a man like i can go out walking after midnight i can enter a lift with five other people and not mm. think for a moment about who who they are yeah. you know whereas women have to carry this kind of extra layer mm. of them and just becoming aware of that layer then just opens one one out to more kind of complexity now mm. it seems from your writing that you're very self reflective right so there's nothing in that sense there aren't so many unknown unknowns there might be known unknowns like what is a city like at night mm. but there aren't unknown unknowns like there was for me when i didn't realize that people had this mm. other layer of awareness mm. they had to mm. go through so uh, how has your gaze your way of looking at the world in all its aspects you know not just from the point of view of gender but just how has your gaze overall of looking at the world changed uh, uh, through your life and i ask this not just in a writerly context of the things you write but just mm. as a person in general i think uh, women in general do carry a lot of baggage that men don't carry but then men also carry some baggage that women don't so i don't know whether we can sort of draw some kind of uh, thing there but uh, women i think live with a lot of anxiety i mean uh, if you are traveling on a bus for instance you are traveling on a train you are constantly have to be aware of who the next person is why that person is that person looking at you they tend to especially in a bus in a crowded bus i have experienced i don't think uh, there'd be any woman possibly who has traveled on an indian bus and not been groped or not been you know sort of so that kind of experience will never be a man's experience or never be or sometimes it could be a man's experience too but i mean it's it's the norm for women so it's that kind of anxiety plus there's so many other anxieties or even as a writerly person i mean if you're trying to write there there are so many things that crowd your mind even if you say get 4 hours a day or that's that's luxury but say 2 hours a day uh, but your mind has to be empty for you to be able to write but the woman will often have the kitchen or the children or something else like that domestic worries on her mind whereas a man i think from my sense of it uh, if a man gets say 2 or 3 hours then the mind can be free of many other things unless of course there are other worries that uh, other worries in the world that you are worried about or your bank stuff or something else you know which uh, you are worrying about but otherwise these domestic worries are not a man's worry as such you know you are you, and then people say oh, you did get that much time but you somehow that my mind space has always been crowded by other things so in, in many ways women do have a much more difficult time of it especially if you're trying to do something like writing which needs hours and hours, hours of time and you may not produce a single line at the end of it you know people will not understand that you spent so much time and what were you doing all this while if you didn't write you know that's the normal question so uh but that of course is the same for both men and women but i mean yeah, women will often have this worry about you know other things on their minds when even when they are writing and and one of the things writers do is just using the power of imagination they can obviously come out of their own skin mm. get into someone else's skin transmit that to mm. the reader yeah. and the reader experiences uh, herself in a different way because that has happened and i notice this particularly how well you've done this in your story other skies which you published in patalipi which you translated your own story mm. basically so i've obviously read it in english where the character is a guy called altaf ahmed and i was very struck by this bit where it's after 2001 the riots have happened in gujarat he's far away from that but you capture his interior life so well where you talk about how he sees a woman in a burqa and he starts thinking about how long it would take for the burqa to burn or mm. when he sort of when somebody asks him his name he stammers mm. while yeah. telling his name because he is so aware of it and i absolutely love that story because it started off with this stark interior life of this guy and then went into this really magical place and i won't give a spoiler alert but there were these sort of mm. two sort of introductions of uh, magic within the, the the story which just took it to another different level and in some ways i mean i mean i was also going to saving a question for later about whether you've read murakami because it seemed almost murakami esque what you did mm. with that story mm. but to get first get back to the question where you've entered this character's head these are not thoughts you would have had you would never have had to stammer while saying your name mm. you mm. would not have wondered about how long it takes a burqa yeah. to burn yeah. uh, you know so what is that process then like of you know being able to do something like this of widening your gaze like this is it mm. something that came to you with age is this something you would have been able to do at 20 or is it the terror of being a little older and mm. well uh Yes you are you're right i mean i do get into the character but i mean this is something 
I mean, I don't know if it's particular to me. I think everyone was thinking Every like writer, that. Every good writer, yeah. I mean, not just writer. I mean, that, that that was a time when pe- this was very much a topic of conversation everywhere. People were discussing the Gujarat riot and what happened and, you know, this so-and-so happened. This this is what somebody felt on the train. This is what somebody walking down the road experienced, you know. So, constantly there was talk in the air of uh, this uh, thing. So, I mean, it was not very difficult, actually, to get into that person's shoes. I mean, after all, I mean, what a, would a person with a Muslim name at that time be thinking? You know, there's a great anxiety around and there's fear spilling or, you know, out of every Muslim home, every person. And But since then, I have changed my view a little. I mean, now, of course, it might be more true. But at that point, I mean, there were like we went out and you often met Muslims who were not anxious at all or possibly because they had not been aware of what was going on. They had not heard they were in UP and this is something happening in Gujarat. I don't know, but. People were saying their names. People were happily sort of doing, going about their jobs. So it wasn't as as if everyone was nervous. But I think the people around us, people in the middle class that gets to hear of these things much more, we were nervous. We used to think you know, like this. And once you're thinking in such terms, in then it's not difficult to get into, at least I, I think, it's not difficult to get into such a person's shoes. I mean, there's another story which I thought might be more difficult to get into. Uh, uh, there's a story that I wrote, which is now going to be part of my new collection that's about to be out. The proofs have arrived and I have not been able to look at them <laughs> because I'm here. So anyway, there's this story I wrote called Mujrim Farar, which is about a rapist. And it's from it's written in the rapist's voice. you know. And uh, I broadly, I was reacting to, I read reports of the rape that took place in the Shakti Mills in Bombay. And uh, it kind of set off something in me, you know, what happens, what goes on in a person who's done this heinous crime, what does such a person think? So I tried to look at it from his point of view and to give it his voice. So it's basically written like that. I mean, I shouldn't again give spoilers, but, <laughs> but it's uh, he's following and it, the whole act of raping that girl is described and I've given him a certain language, which is a part of uh, UP speak and a part of Bombay lingo. Uh, you know, the filmy Bollywood lingo, rather, the f- uh, languages, language that he's probably absorbed from watching films. So it's from his point of view and how he does this act. And then he runs away. And, you know, I shouldn't tell you the whole story. But basically, it's trying to inhabit a rapist's shoes. So that's and I'm trying to give it some kind. I mean, I'm giving it a. I mean, it's a story of protest, basically. Let me put it in a very wide yeah. sort of sense. So it's that and there are other stories I've written which are also about characters. I mean, somebody once asked me, do you think of yourself as a political writer? So actually, I don't. I don't think of myself as an overtly political writer. But I mean, if you're writing about things around you which are happening, everything is political that goes on in this country. But it's also experienced through your own persona, which and I think... Uh, I'm not sure I approve of the completely statement, political statement type stories, you know, because I think there are two different kinds of stories. One is, of course, when you are trying to comment on what's going on around you and uh, sort of pick up some incident that's happened or some movement that's going on and you write about it in a kind of expository sort of style. And there's the other thing in which you leave yourself empty and you absorb impressions and somehow your writer's voice comes out. It is not your conscious voice. It's something else that has been happening inside you and there's a certain logic to that writing that is not trying to make a comment on what's going on. It's not a statement. It's not. So I have tended more to the second second style of writing. But because I live in a certain environment, then obviously what I'm writing will be political because I'm absorbing things from around and how can you not be political in Indian environment? So it's like that. So inhabiting shoes, a writer has to inhabit someone else's shoes. How will you write? You can't write just about yourself. You have to write about someone else. Which sort of brings me to this modern kind of dilemma about the uh, how the environment around us is changing in terms of how people receive writing like i completely agree with you a writer has to occupy other people's heads uh, wear other people's shoes i mean that's a whole that's a whole game but at the same time you have people talk about things like cultural appropriation and so mm. on and i can totally imagine somebody uh, criticizing you daring to put yourself in the head of someone called altaf ahmed and saying that that's appropriation you know seed the platform and all of that mm. and uh, uh, and that's just one sort of political 
aspect that kind of comes into commentary on literature but i see other commentary on literature also come from political places like that you know you're showing a, you're showing male toxicity and blah 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 as if you know i mean characters have to be real the world is what it is you know that's it's our job to kind of write about that uh, so what do you think about this kind of strident politics which is uh, so often even evaluating literature through a political lens hmm. rather than just seeing a book for what it is yeah i mean i have my problems with it uh, frankly because uh, what i mean what is cultural appropriation even mean i mean if you're going to write about some something anything any person who is not yourself then it's cultural appropriation isn't it okay. who will you write about at the end of the day you will come down to yourself and you are only allowed to write about yourself and even that is not uh, one self one as we know can we contain many people inside ourselves too so that too is appropriation then so where does this argument lead so it just seems to me a very very flawed kind of thing and it's a it's basically a political argument it's not a literary argument at all because literature means other people how can you write literature without talking about other people it would be no literature then so and when so much of literature is looked at through a political lens not just in the context of appropriation yeah. but other contexts yeah. yeah. where you know only a woman of color is allowed to write about another woman of color yeah. and so on things yeah. like that do you feel that then people start approaching literature in the long way and in a sense losing something losing out on all the yeah. richness that there is yeah absolutely absolutely i agree with you entirely i mean of course we are losing out in, on this immense richness i mean how can you be how can who who allows you why should anyone allow you or not allow you i mean you are a free person you can write what you like you know of course this whole hurt sentiments business is there but i mean like premchand was uh, i mean now being cast- castigated for using words like chamar and you know using caste names which were just caste names simply he's not using them in a derog- derogatory sense but i mean there's this whole dalit uh, movement going on against him that how dare he write how can he write about people whom he is a high caste person so why is he writing about these people how dare he write about our lives you know it's the same sort of thing which goes on in other ways in other countries like blacks and uh, you know the whole rights movements they are all sort of related to that and as as you pointed out on yesterday on premchand he actually wrote about them with great symp- sympathy oh, yes. even making yes. them out to be victims yeah. and some people would object to even that as in why are you showing yeah. them as victims but yeah. yeah yeah so there's no end to it really i mean the writer's job is to write and get on with it I mean, rather than get stuck in all these arguments i think wise words we'll take a quick commercial break and then when we come back uh, i have so much else left to discuss do you want to read more I've put in a lot of work in recent years in building a reading habit. This means that I read more books, but I also read more long-form articles and essays. There's a world of knowledge available through the internet, but the problem we all face is how do we navigate this knowledge? How do we know what to read? How do we put the right incentives in place? Well, I discovered one way. A couple of friends of mine run this awesome company called CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds.com, which aims to help people uplevel themselves by reading more. A few months ago, I signed up for one of their programs called the Daily Reader. Every day for six months, they sent me a long-form article to read. The subjects covered went from machine learning to mythology to mental models and marmalade. This helped me build a habit of reading. At the end of every day, I understood the world a little better than I did before. So, if you want to build your reading habit, head on over to CTQ Compounds and check out their Daily Reader. New batches start every month. They also have a great program called Future Stack, which helps you stay up to date with ideas, skills, and mental models that will help you stay relevant in the future. Future Stack batches start every Saturday. Also, check out their Social Capital Compound, which helps you master social media. What's more, you get a discount of a whopping twenty five hundred rupees, two thousand five hundred, if you use the discount code unseen. So head on over to CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds dot com and use the code unseen. Up level yourself. Welcome back to the scene and the unseen. I'm chatting with Sarah Rai about her life, her work, her writing. and so on and so forth you know while reading about premchand while reading in fact about your mom and your aunt one interesting theme that kind of came up was that how the language determined how easy it was to get published in the sense premchand started writing in urdu he wrote for a few years for an urdu journal but then he shifted to hindi and the publishing scene just seemed to be more vibrant at that time for him and similarly your mom and her aunt also you know would write in urdu but would publish in hindi because that was easier and my 
question here really is that as a writer, I think that there is sort of this dual imperative which put, pu- pushes you in opposite directions. And one imperative is that you, of course, want readers. Readers matter. So you want to, you want your work to be read, you want to be relevant, and that might lead you towards changing your voice in a particular way to be more accessible. That might lead you to picking subjects that are more in vogue, so to say. But the other uh, part of that dual imperative is that you also just want to be true to yourself, that there are things that you care about and whatever kind of comes out, whatever you care the most about, you want to write about that, whether or not there are readers. And and of course, the danger of that is that it can be a path to self-indulgence if you, you know, especially if in terms of uh, the style and the idiom, you don't think of the reader at all. And so these are kind of dual imperatives. The danger on one side is that you, you lose yourself in the quest for finding more readers and uh, the danger on the other side is that you become self-indulgent and no, no one can relate to you so is this something that you have kind of thought about or uh, yeah i mean yeah i've been asked this question before and i think it's uh when one is actually writing one is, one doesn't have a reader in mind i i don't i mean it's there's some kind of in in critic inside you which is trying to get the writing to reach a certain standard. So you're writing, following that voice, your own voice, and to see whether the story is reaching where you wanted it to reach. And the reader, of course, is important, but the reader comes in later. You know, so when you're at the point of writing, if you started tailoring your narrative to the reader, then you'd really get nowhere because, I mean, there are so many readers and they'd all be wanting different things. So at the point of writing, it really doesn't matter. And in fact, if you think about a reader, then it's usually just two or three friends or somebody who you know has read you or some you think, what would they think? You know, sometime. But even that doesn't really enter at the point of writing. And uh, yes, the other thing, of course, is true. I mean, if you started tailoring your narrative, then you have lost what you wanted to write, you know. And uh, the voice also can't, you can't tailor the voice to the reader and the content certainly not. You know, the content is, I mean, of course, you may choose the language like you gave the example of Prem Chand or my uh, mothers. I like to call them both mothers. So they were writing and uh, they, uh, of course, my, my, the fact that my father was also publishing Kahani at that time, that may have played a role in the choice of language too. But then, I mean, this was a Hindi literary scene that they were aware of, whereas I'm not sure that they knew about what was a comparable journal in Urdu, for instance, if they had wanted to publish. There must have been, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether they knew of it also. So it was wider dissemination, ease of publication. And for Premchand, of course, uh, it's true that he did it because it, it had a wider reach and he was wanting his message to go to as many people as possible. So in his case, it was certainly true. And in, in their case, too, it was with a slight difference in the uh, stress of it. But yes, it was true that they changed the language. But uh, changing the language didn't mean that they changed the... I mean, the language was the same. It was a different script. Just the script was changed. So it didn't really make a difference. Whereas in Premchand, of course, the Urdu versions and the Hindi versions are completely different. And it, there's a whole, in fact, a lot of confusion about which work was written first in Urdu and which one, because there are many of them which have both versions. And, uh, you know, so we don't know which one. In many cases, you don't know which version was written first and which was written second. And there were also translations that he uh, commissioned. A commission or he got other people to do. Commission is like a very modern word. It, he didn't commission them in that sense. But, I mean, other people were also transcribing his stories from one language to the other. So we don't know which ones were done by him. He himself had done something or somebody else had done it and which one came first, which one came second. But often the versions are completely different, like a lot of difference. Wow. Tell me a little bit about, like you often mentioned that you write in Hindustani, mm-hmm. uh, which I find is an important distinction. Now, like you said, at one level, Hindi and Urdu are the same you know, the same roots and everything. At another level, they are now different, uh, you know, driven to that difference by forces of politics and so on and so forth. Mm. So tell my listeners a little bit more about that. I know both your um, uncle Amritra and your cousin Alokra have written books on this subject. Mm. But, you know, just enlighten me a little bit more about what this process is because most people listening to this would think Hindi and Urdu are different languages and Hindi is the language of the Hindus of India and Urdu is the language of people in Pakistan. And actually the thing is, uh, they are both the same language and that language itself which they were was a confluence of many many influences and sources from 
all over the place so uh, yeah. tell me a little bit about well, uh, this i don't know if i'll be able to tell you uh, so very exactly about the because alok has written a book on it and he would be absolutely the person you should talk to absolutely, about this absolutely i will but then of course uh, politics has entered into it and hindi becomes you know for reasons that we all know it uh, starts to eliminate all the urdu words and in fact it's so difficult to eliminate the urdu words from hindi because simple words like pani or you know stuff like that you know very very basic words are you know urdu origin words so how can you sort of divorce the two things but this process is going on in, and it's tying in with the larger politics of the country as the country is becoming sort of more and more hinduized let's call it the irony of it is that urdu was actually called hindi first you know urdu was hindi i mean hindi meant urdu and then later these names became i mean there's a whole history there so it's like i don't know if i'm uh, competent enough to speak on this kind of thing just now but i mean of course there's a whole story behind it which perhaps if you have a look on your show one day you might be able to enlighten you okay that's the plan i'll get you to put in touch with him and i'll also link his book from the show notes for those who yeah. want more the interesting thing is like i read at the start uh, your uncle's book on this amrit rai's book on this is that hindi was actually a general term used for people who lived in india so there is even like an old text which talks about how i think amir khusro's text about how uh, you know people under uh, a certain emperor if hindus came to his attention they they would be trampled by elephants but other hindis like the muslims would be spared you mm. know so it's interesting how words also evolve to take on particular meanings and people mm. forget the origin and in fact so much of what we consider uh, indian authentically indian mm. and sanskari today actually yeah. came from outside like yeah, 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 like yeah, the elegant churidar kurtas of modi ji oh, oh absolutely <laughs> everything there's so much in the way of food in the way of dress yeah. i mean everything i mean it's such a very mixed culture you know it's just impossible to separate things into how can you do that i mean it's just complete bloody mindedness i think that these people are trying to push this run down people's throats before we get to talking more about your writing processes and all which also i yeah. do let's take this digression into how this country is kind of changing and in a sense your own family is a great example of a syncretic india this khichri where everything is mixing easily of course uh, you know premchand was progressive in the sense that he married a child widow his second wedding was to a, a very formidable lady and a writer in her own right who I'll ask you to speak about as well and so on down the line there have been mixed marriages as just you know in, in a sense your family reflects the khichri that india is and yet today we live in a time where simplified narratives that sort of reduce our culture that reduce individuals to a particular thing are in vogue where you know hinduism is being reduced to sort of a particular brahmanical strain of it you know or, and in some ways almost carrying or almost sort of harking back to the tradition of other western religions which are religions of the book so to say and we of course don't have a book yeah. it's a completely open culture but there is a sense that you know uh, you're trying to center around one of our great gods which is ram and you're trying to mm. you know reduce it down to that and similarly in terms of language like a quick summary for readers who might not be aware of it is that the politicization of you know how language changed really began because there was a political movement to mark out hindi as separate from urdu and hindi in devanagari as a language of the hindus of india and for that one of the idioms kind of created was this very artificial sanskritized hindi shuddh hindi as it were which i remember being taught in my school which no one actually speaks like like your own writing is much more the way everyday yeah. people speak yeah. the colloquial speak yeah. but there is this artificial kind of shuddh hindiness which has come up and the prime minister speaks in it which is very interesting because i don't know how people relate to that you know he's otherwise in terms of polemics and speech making and all for whatever it's worth you got to give him credit he does reach out to many people and he's built a cult around himself but i don't i don't understand how the language works there because it's a language nobody really speaks but all that apart a lot of the change that is happening in our country uh, in, in many alarming ways is something which people locate in the hindi heartland in up yeah. in the places yeah. where you live yeah. tell me from your lived experiences of whether culturally uh, the changes as drastic as it seems or it is only vocal elements of this current time and vocal elements of this political movement who make it seem that way No, it's it's very much present. I think it's just uh, very present uh, in in your everyday lives. I mean, the sounds around you have changed. The way people walk has changed. The way people laugh has changed. I think. I mean, this whole thing that's going on, this Hinduization, let's call it. I mean, it's it's very very present, and especially uh, 
uh, in UP because I mean and you can see even among the people who are around you who were not sort of so very right wing so I mean it, things have changed but now more people you meet are sort of going to sort of be I mean you will be noticed much more as a kind of anomaly in society rather than you know somebody who's part of a structure and uh, I, when my parents got married in 1948 I mean it was a Hindu Muslim marriage and this we are talking of uh, the year right after partition and there was nothing no furor made over it you know it happened peacefully nobody noticed before that my uncle had also married a Hindu wife and uh, I mean then too I mean it was not I mean like today there's this whole business of love jihad carrying on no I mean nobody thought of it like that earlier I mean it's just something very it's a political thing that's being imposed on people's lives, you know, and, it, and it's impacting everyone, I think, in a very, very obvious, in a very negative uh, way. So, lots of people you meet, I mean, it's just the whole experience of living has changed in very drastic ways. And and you, you kind of mentioned about how, you know, uh, Love Jihad wasn't a big deal then. I did an episode on the Gita Press with Akshay Mukul and he yeah. written a great book on it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the interesting thing that I discovered there is issue, the issues like cow slaughter, Love Jihad, all these issues have really been coming down from decades since mm. the 20s, if not mm. before, there have been live political yeah. issues. Like either they were underground and they've only come overground now or they were the fringe and they've become the mainstream now. And I'm... I don't know which one I'm more inclined to believe. And of course, these two are subtly different in the sense mm. that underground and having coming overground would mean that many people felt this but never actually said it or never expressed themselves. And uh, that expression has found its place now and politics has caught up with culture. Or that it, it was a fringe belief. And, uh, these were fringe beliefs and fringe insecurities that have somehow spread. So which of the two do you think there are? Because even I, in my own life, there are many people I have known for decades who I have to look at with new eyes because they are saying things and doing things mm. that yeah, exactly. are surprising to me. Yeah. And I'm sure the same has, mm. you know, you've experienced the yeah. same as yeah. I think everyone has. So, you know, is it that they were like that all uh, along or is it that something changed? What happened? Well, this is something we talk about all the time, Amit. I mean, I can't believe that this was the case always, that all these feelings were buried and now they have suddenly, you know, come to the fore because suddenly we have a Hindu government in power. It's not, I don't think it's that so much. It's probably they are getting influenced by each other and also this whole thing of power. I mean, you know, the party in power and they tend to fall in line. You know, people have this, I think people, especially in India, have a great thing for uh, just being, you know, following like uh, sort of herd mentality. I mean, if someone is like that, then they tend to be like that too, you know. So it's it's that. And of course, everyone loves Narendra Modi, that's for sure. So they are following him. So there's uh, that. I mean, I don't believe that they were like this always. And even now in the common man, if you see on the street, I mean, if they pass a, even a masjid or they pass some kind of somebody's grave, they will bend their head. I mean, they will sort of bow down to it. It's not as if they are all sort of very kind of militant Hindus or something. They are Hindus, but they are not like that, you know. So I can't, I don't know how this, quite this is, how this is being transmitted. But it's certainly taking, I mean, the mind of people is definitely being changed. You know, the ways of looking at things, you know, and they are possibly being shown the way. They are being shown that, look, this is, you have this, these people have been, I mean, a sense of hurt is being created where it was not, it, it was... Just everyone is living peacefully together. How did this suddenly start happening? I can't, it's very hard to pinpoint. And it's getting worse every day. And I mean, and people are not even like all these young Muslim boys being lynched. Why is there not more of an outcry or what is it? You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's something that we see or even those poor boys in Kashmir whose sort of eyes are being, you know, all these pellets are being shot at them. There's so much cruelty happening all around. So what is it? What is it? No. And it, it just reminds me more and more of, you know, Nazi era in Germany. When I don't know if you've read this book called uh, East-West Street. I forget the no, name of the writer. Well, it's about uh, this, the laws that were made, uh, you know, with all, all the sort of, war, you know, laws that were made after the, uh, wars during the wars, whatever sort of anti-Jewish uh, lobby was sort of, I mean, they were trying to make laws to counteract those. So in that book, 
uh, there's this person, there's a police uh, person who's killing a Jew on the street. So this uh, this guy, I forget, I've forgotten all the names. He comes up and he sees this policeman killing this Jew. So he says, why are you doing this? I mean, have you no soul? So the man sort of does, doesn't say anything and he turns around and he shoots the guy and he's also gone. You know, so it's just that people seem to have no conscience left or conscience is too sort of uh, asking for too much already. I mean, they just have no sense. Maybe there's a certain blindness that has taken over, different sort of blindness. Because I think as a society, we are pretty blind anyway. I mean, like the middle class is completely blind to the poor person on the street. We just don't see. Yeah. We just don't see what's happening. You know, we have lost the capacity to stand in anyone else's shoes. And uh, we just can't see that this person, what kind of life would this person be leading? You know, we just, we are impervious to it completely. We are looking at our own little feathering our own smallness and, you know, not looking at anyone on the street. So it's this is a different sort of blindness that we don't notice anyone else's pain. Yeah, and that, that's so true. Like the name, name of my show is, of course, a scene in the unseen. But one way in which this plays out in our everyday lives is all the things we are blind to on a daily basis. Like mm. you correctly said, when I stop at a traffic signal, yeah. there might be someone outside my window, but that person is invisible to me. I'm yeah, in a different yeah. city. Yeah. That person is in a different city. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm reminded of three kind of social science concepts, which I'll quickly run through because, hey, why not digress? And uh, I'll ask you what you think of them. And one of them comes from the social scientist Cass Sunstein. He calls it group polarization. So he did this very interesting experiment mm. where he got a bunch of, uh, like I forget the exact ideologies in play, but let's say a bunch of Democrats and a bunch of Republicans. Mm. And he put the Republicans together in a room for a kind of group discussion and he put the Democrats together in a room. And they took their views on certain subjects before the discussion and after the discussion. And after it, they found that after the discussion, the entire opinion of the group became more extreme. Yeah. So that the most moderate person in the group yeah. from the uh, results mm. before yeah. was more extreme than the whole group mm. had been, mm. yeah. uh, you know, um, before the thing in, in kind of both directions. And yeah. he called this group polarization. And perhaps there is a sense of this. Okay, the, the other one is... Um, I, I forget who the author is, but it, it, in the early 20th century, there was a study of lynching, how lynching happens, how crowds uh, work, mm, how mobs mm, work. Yeah. And what that found was that there are different thresholds at which someone will lynch someone. Mm. Like the mechanism of lynching typically is this. And a friend of mine who was lynched, and lynched, by the way, doesn't mean killed. It means beaten up by yeah, a crowd. Yeah. So a friend of mine, the journalist Rishi Majumdar, was once lynched in that way. And he lived to tell the tale, uh, thankfully. And he described how it happened to him, where he mm. was somewhere in the heartland. Yeah. And he was talk and a group of people were arguing with him. Mm. And it was just an argument. And suddenly somebody who was not even part of the argument from the fringes mm. came and slapped him. And then one more guy came and slapped him uh, and then eventually they all yeah, beat him up. Yeah. And uh, how it works is that everyone apparently has a threshold at which they start beating someone. Mm. Where a complete sociopath may just start hitting yeah. someone without yeah. anyone else. Another person will become violent himself if he sees five other people do it. Another person become violent if he sees a hundred other people do it. Mm. So just thinking aloud, it seems that maybe we've reached a chain of events where more and more thresholds are being reached. So even someone mm. who would otherwise have seemed moderate yeah. is now getting carried yeah. away by the yeah. mob. Yeah. And the third phenomenon is something coined by the sociologist Timur Kuran in his 1999 book, Private Truths, Public Lies which is preference falsification, mm. which is that there are certain views at a particular point in time, which you keep to yourself because you feel it's not polite to say it. Yeah. Like I'm, you know, if somebody feels a woman's place is in the kitchen, he mm. won't say it because he knows others will disapprove. Yeah. But if he finds 50 other people say it, then he'll feel emboldened to say that, mm. yes, that is what our culture says. Yeah. And uh, that creates what Quran called a preference cascade. Like mm. an example he gave was in the Soviet Union, where everybody living in the Soviet Union would feel that they were the only dissenters because nobody mm. else was expressing. Mm. But once enough people expressed that, you had a preference yeah. cascade and it was almost yeah. overnight that the Soviet Union tumbled. Mm. And I feel that social media created these preference cascades where you could have had a certain amount of innate bigotry within you, where you might have felt resentment towards Muslim men or you might have feel, mm. uh, felt resentment towards whoever the other is. Mm. And you don't say it because by and large everyone seems decent. But then you have this kind of preference yeah, cascade where everybody's it. saying yeah. it. And mm. then you become like that. And therefore, my feeling is that it is not as if someone who is overtly a bigot today 
was a bigot yesterday or was not a bigot yesterday that bigotry was perhaps a small part of the multitudes he contains yeah. Yeah. but that has now been amplified and given expression hmm. by this and everything that is being amplified today is the worst of us because that's what tends yeah. to get yeah. amplified so these are sort of my ramblings on this hmm. Yeah I I agree with you I think uh, there's something something innate there is something innate which gets kind of uh, you know it gets uh, the uh, flame is fanned or whatever you know sort of and uh, one person follows the other and then that starts I mean if it's something that you think will can be justified and because there are so many other people who feel the same way then perhaps it will be easier for you to express that the the element of politeness as you said and they were too polite to express it that has gone completely and now you feel that i will perhaps be praised for this very same thing so they are i mean i think it does happen like that i mean i have often wondered at this in a more general and a broader sense about the source of evil i mean like how uh, if you if i see a person walking on the road does that person hide in himself a murderer i mean it, that thought has occurred to me at how do you make a normal person who's just leading a very ordinary life living somewhere in a town and with his family why does that person where does that person suddenly uh, discover this seed of evil in him that he does this you know and but this is a very large moral kind of question which i am not sure can be answered that easily and uh, but it is something like that there is in human nature something that you know that can be brought out and but it's very hard to believe that so many people always believed you know that muslims are bad or whatever because i mean after all if muslims had to sort of do this or convert people or whatever i mean they've been in ruling for years and years hundreds of years and they didn't do it and we still survive as a nation which is pretty much a multicultural i mean multi religious nation up till now so how can they believe this you know and that's just a bit of a puzzle for me maybe it's it's like schrodinger's india that both truths can be true like i remember i had the the politician and thinker jp narayan on my show yeah. and i put it to him that india was a deeply illiberal country and of course where i'm get our society is deeply illiberal and where i'm getting it from is the way women are treated and all mm. the divisions caste yeah. caste all of that yeah. and he said that he made an interesting point he said that that's true but if you look at it another way india can also be considered in its in its lived reality these are my words not his mm. india can also be considered in its lived reality to be liberal because we are such a confluence of so many different you know yeah. experiences yeah. we have coexisted for so mm. long we've mm. been multi religious for so long yeah. as you said like thing i forget who it was gandhi or naipaul or churchill whatever one of them yeah. who said that whatever mm. you say of india the opposite is also That's true. true yeah yeah exactly so uh, Yes, because we, uh, I mean, and also compared to some many other societies, we are liberal still. Yeah. I mean, after all, we can get away with, some, you know, we can say some things and, you know, still get away with like them. Like you and I can have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so in other many other places, this would not be possible. So yeah. I suppose in in a on a kind of relative sort of thing. I mean, we perhaps would be called liberal, but though that is slowly, slowly or very rapidly getting eroded. Yeah. and we are very fast becoming a nation of Ill- intolerant people you know i want to go back to your musing from a couple of moments ago where you said that you know when you pass a person on the road you wonder does that person carry the seed of a murderer uh, inside himself and something that i've been thinking about for a long time is how uh, the self is co- contingent and it's contingent on a series of accidents like uh, the the steven pinker once said nature gives us uh, knobs nurture turns them and both are of course pure luck and accident you know mm, the genes that yeah, we are born yeah, with and yeah. what circumstances do to us those circumstances even include things like the chemical composition of the brain for example mm. like mm. Uh, one of my favorite musicians chris cornell killed himself a couple of years ago and uh, one of the possible reason was he was on some kind of medication which was later found to make people depressive and all of that mm. so you change the chemical composition yeah. of yeah. it and the person yeah. completely changes and i am reminded about this by something you wrote in your beautiful essay in uh, caravan where you uh, wrote about your dad and i'll read this uh, passage out you are describing how your father met you in 1994 when he yeah. uh, came from a train quote uh, my father's hair was uncombed clean shaven all his life he now had a beard born of negligence his nails were long and yellow and a wilderness had taken over his eyes he had grown senile he would stand about in doorways having forgotten what he had come to the room for after my mother died he stood by her bed and looked at the quilt bunched up on it as if he suspected that she was underneath it never interested in food he developed a sweet tooth he ate the rasgullas that were 
bought for him from Hira Halwai with a focused pleasure. He wiped his hand afterwards on his white dhoti. This was a father I did not know. Stop quote. And this really spoke to me because I have seen the same process in both of my parents, who for mm. different reasons became different people at the end of their lives. Mm. Uh, people I almost could not recognize. One in a not so good way, and one in a good way, and and it's something that. often leads me to reflect on my own self that i feel so confident in who i am hmm. but it is all contingent yes. something outside my control could completely change it and you know and as a writer this is sort of something that you've kind of commented on you know mm, o- mm, over here mm. and w- what are you, your feelings on uh, well actually yeah i mean i also have a story uh, not quite like this but it's also about a, a woman who sort of has a dementia like thing you know she becomes I mean, it's basically about these two friends who live next door to each other and they it's also about the first period about this girl who gets the first menstrual period and the other girl who hasn't yet got it so they interchange and you know all that and then this it's a description of a friendship and then uh both of them go their separate ways this girl goes away to study somewhere the other one remains behind in the town and then when they meet again she sees this other girl who has the period and this one who hasn't she sees her getting off a rickshaw and uh, she recognizes her and she says oh i know you but i have uh, now i have difficulty re- recognizing people because it's something that has happened and i can think of things i can remember things that happened a very long time ago but i can't remember things that happened say yesterday so uh, she's basically in this kind of state she's got this dementia and it carries on so they meet if, after very long periods and uh, uh, the next time they meet is this girl's the dementia girl's brother has died and uh, sh- this other one goes to see the i mean for condolence and she sees this girl and she's oh yeah i forgot the very crucial thing of it <laughs> that when uh, she the, this girl has her first period and she tells the, her friend about it and she says no don't tell my mother because i went and touched the statues of the gods uh, while i was impure and uh, she would be upset if you told her so don't tell her that and then at this now 40 years have passed 50 years have passed and this girl is with dementia she doesn't remember anything but she says let me take you to my mother and she'll be very happy to see you and she's just lost her son and whatever she'll be consoled when she sees you but and she says in a lower voice don't tell her about that you know she remembers that day that has now finished and it's all gone everything is finished around her but that day is still crystal clear in her memory she just it's nothing of it has changed it has stayed with her all these years and she just that's the one thing about the friendship that she remembers so of course this girl meets the mother and she doesn't tell her anything all that and then she goes away and she never goes back again so that's where the story ends so this is also sort of dementia comes into yeah, that story exactly. too so it's about well people do change and i think it's not just chemicals that, i mean not drugs or anything that change the wiring in your brain sometimes it's just circumstance and sometimes the people have that condition you know so many conditions you know you can become bipolar yeah. you can become you know some kind of other alzheimer or whatever you know and the composition of your brain has changed in the meantime so you don't know what has caused this to happen so yes it is we become different people throughout our lives i suppose we keep changing and by the end of it we probably wouldn't recognize that earlier person who we were so what do you think of the uh, uh, earlier sarah rai the person in her 20s like I, you know when i look back on the younger me i am kind of filled with astonishment that that person managed to become this older me i mm. mean i just don't like him at all it's like another person i'm like what and then mm. you begin to kind of question your sense of self and say that right, yeah. what is it that that person and i have in common apart mm. from the name and apart from all that and it's yeah. have you reflected well, on your younger uh, self uh, uh, well at that point of what i do think is that one was not thinking of anything at all one was just going through life just as as the days came you just lived it and you went on so you, there was no process of thinking really about where i'm headed what should i be doing there was no kind of conceptual framing of a life at that stage you know and now i regret it almost that i should have done this i should have done that why didn't i read this why didn't i write that why didn't i start my writing career much earlier all the all those regrets i do have but then one was leading you had all the time in the world now i feel that time is finishing i have to do what i have there's a kind of urgency that has taken over my life you know and then one didn't think of it i mean it was just a whole life stretching ahead in front of you 
and you could do what with it what you liked. So most of it was spent just going out with friends or reading or listening to music or whatever. I mean, there was no direction as such. But I don't know how this whole direction business came in in the first place because, well, I was not as such. I mean, I wanted to be a writer, but I was not really doing anything about it. You know, I was not going about it with any kind of seriousness. But suddenly, I mean, it did take me by surprise, I suppose, that I wrote my first story. I was in Australia then and we were there. My husband was doing his research there. So we were there for about six years. And uh, I wrote my first story there. It was already quite late. I mean, I was in my 30s, not 40s, but 30s. And uh, I, I sent my stories to my father, who at that point was quite all right. I mean, he didn't have this dementia thing that I spoke of later. And so he read my stories. He liked them. He sort of, he felt sort of happy that somebody had taken after, you know, whatever. Somebody was also writing in the family in among this generation. So all that did take place. But... Uh, I mean, if I had to live it all again, which of course I won't, I would have started this much earlier. And uh, I just feel a sense of waste, of a wasted life in a sense that you come to things very late. And then when you realize there's so little left, it's, it's that sadness of it takes. I, I had a episode I really liked doing with uh, uh, Kavita Rao, who's written a wonderful mm. books on Our Lady Doctors. And we spoke a lot about late blooming there. And uh, like her mother started learning sitar at 75 and now at 77, mm. she apparently yeah. plays it uh, very well. And I remembered, uh, you know, Penelope Fitzgerald, the great mm. uh, novelist yeah, who yeah, started yeah. writing in her 60s and won yeah. the booker and all yeah. that and just lovely novels. So here's the thing, you know, you start your essay in Caravan by talking about how your dad, when he met you, uh, mm. uh, you know, made, made you sit down and you're already around 40 at this time or mm. thereabouts and made you yeah. write. Uh, the following words, quote, mm. Catherine Mansfield, you will be the Catherine Mansfield of India, stop quote. And, and what strikes me here is that he has a vision for you. He wants you to be this and this is somehow important. Yeah. And equally in your words, when you talk about starting too late or feeling that there is not enough time, there is sort of the implication that you have set out for yourself something to do or something to achieve. And you know, and I also have those regrets sometimes that, oh, I could have written 10 books by now. Mm. I never had this yeah. and all of that. Yeah. But also, I tell myself that it is sometimes dangerous to have that one vision of yourself or those big dreams because they never happen. What mm. is more important is to keep doing what you love doing and whatever happens, happens and you live in the moment. And when you're gone, you're gone anyway. You know, this mm. whole concept of a legacy, yeah. I don't know what it means. So what do you think about that especially uh, you know given the pressure of the sort of family you came from and if you mm. also then think of yourself as a writer there might be the sense that oh i have to become xyz mm. and even now when you speak of uh, you know not enough time which i don't agree with there is enough time for all of us and mm. too little time for all of us in mm. another respect yeah. but uh, uh, how well, do you actually actually i i think the struggle was not to become someone like i mean it was not an i mean not ambitious in that sense but a, a desire to have a better utilized life, you know, not to have wasted so much, yeah, yeah. you know, because there's so much that one doesn't know, so little one has read, so much of other systems of knowledge that one is completely oblivious to. I mean, you just, what do we know of, you know, sort of uh, Muslim learning or even Sanskrit or, you know, there's so many vast sort of areas of knowledge that are completely sort of dark for me, you know. So I just wish that I had done more with that time and one doesn't get the urgency at that point of time because one thinks that one has all the time and you're not even thinking along those lines. You're not thinking that I should be doing this or I wish I knew this. So uh, it was not so much of uh, wanting to become or having written 10 books or whatever, but a kind of engagement with life that could have become be begun earlier <clears throat> and that started late for me, I thought, in a, a certain kind of way of thinking that I could have got into earlier. And I did think and, well, it was a little all over the place. I thought, I mean, I sh it could have been more focused. So if you had to give advice to your younger self in specific terms, what would that be? Write every day. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because writing also sharpens the vision. Yeah. You see, it's not yeah. just what you're producing, but you're learning to see. You know, yeah. the seeing uh -huh. is so important. Uh, is such an important part of being a writer. I couldn't agree more. This is almost yeah. like a, 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 a sort of a 
lament i uh, share yeah. about myself <laughs> <laughs> let's so let's actually now talk about your sort of your writing process yeah. like when you begin writing seriously mm. like my yeah. biggest problem is that you know if there is a structure to something i'm doing for example with the scene in the unseen mm. i know that i have to release it on monday yeah. and therefore i have to get the files ready by so and so yeah. time yeah. and i there's a structure so i get it done but when there isn't a structure like i want to write a book or i want to do this mm. it, it's very hard for me to be able to discipline myself because in the moment there is always something that is in the way so how have you arrived at your sort of writing discipline and writing habits and what what are your sort of processes like well uh, i suppose it uh, means that you spend a lot of time at the job and uh, say if one can manage to while i'm in the process of actually writing the story then i do uh, spend time with it i mean I, i can never rush through a story i mean and uh, i never make drafts it's like when i'm working on a story i keep changing it as i go along and uh, this this used to be a problem when i wrote long hand because then you have to cut and slash and copy out the whole thing again which uh, for much of my earlier writing life i did have these registers full of stories uh and i would cancel them out and rewrite them and all that but this has changed of course with the coming of the computer uh but uh, you do spend a lot of time thinking and thinking and polishing and the thought and integrating uh what you're trying to say with the language with the structure i mean i also tend to use metaphors sometimes like uh, the whole story might be a metaphor for instance there's this story that i wrote called amar vallari which is about losing which is about losing things like and lost spaces it's about lost spaces really i mean about a space that uh, and a space can be a metaphor you know it can be in the story it is a metaphor it's a space of childhood of memory of of an actual physical space which is now being like it's set in a bungalow which is very much like my own bungalow which is all wild and it has gone and it's in the middle of this residential sort of high rise apartments around it and now it's just this one space of wildness left so it's that and wildness i've been kind of obsessed with wildness a little bit in my writing and wildness not just as physical wildness but as a metaphor also like wildness in the sense of solitude like uh, there's a story i wrote called biaban mein which is in the wilderness literally so in that you can be in a sort of uh, mental wilderness i mean there's a little girl in it who's sort of dumb you've read that story i, I think. love that story yeah yes and uh, so i mean wildness has been kind of occupied me a lot and i and it has never been a negative thing it i think it's a space of solitude that uh, one needs and which is very necessary especially for a writer and in solitude it is in solitude only that the thought will come to you the idea will come to you and you will be able to see you know a certain clarity comes when you're alone and you're in solitude so for me the wildness and solitude has become like together it have got merged together as an idea and uh, i think it's very necessary uh, for a writer so that has happened and uh, what was i saying i mean i forgot <laughs> how we started out <laughs> yeah anu we were just sort of talking about your processes of writing yeah processes and, of writing yeah. yeah so it's the it's the solitude and you need to be completely by yourself you need to empty your mind there should not be anything else happening around you which is always a very difficult thing because something or the other is always happening so it's very hard to just do that but then you have to empty yourself out and allow the a voice to take shape you know so it often you just sit for hours and hours and nothing comes so at the end of a day if you come up with a paragraph that's a good day you know and sometimes nothing may come at, come at all and that's a bad day so it's basically it's just that i mean you keep thinking and meditating and you know just waiting for the thing to arrive i love wilderness i wanted to talk about it but i don't have a particular question as such but what i loved about wilderness was again in in a magic realist kind of sense that moment at the end which just kind of transcends the story and just uh, is so so profound and how do you arrive at that in the sense of not in the mechanistic sense of how did you think of this but more in a sense of in terms of process like did you have to write different drafts of the story or were you stuck at that point how do i take it forward or when you begin the story do you know the way it's going to end and you just know what's going to happen and it's not just that story it's also other uh, skies for example hmm. where that that 
crazy end which is again right out of magic mm. realism and it's such a striking image like imagine mm. a cinematic image like that mm. and i don't want to give any spoilers but uh, my mm. listeners will can read those themselves so how does that happen and is it then also a conscious process that you think about how in every story you want to find this moment which kind of crystallizes everything which is like this revelatory moment which is it's a bit of a mystery actually because it comes sort of in a flash i mean it is not something i mean when i start writing there's no story as such that i have in my head right the story as it happens you know it just takes over when you are writing the story you know sh- shapes itself one sentence follows the other and somehow you know the story gets created i am also not very sure how exactly it happens it's a sort of accident i suppose and but that ending that you are talking of that did come to me in a flash i mean the, there are these two people who are locked into their wildernesses of different kinds and suddenly what can unite them and get them out of it is this bus that slowly instead of moving forward it starts rising because they also see themselves at that point they see themselves they see the whole town especially for the writer who is not for the little girl but the writer who must see uh, around her so when she's up there she can see everything very clearly and she also finds that she has got some kind of release from this being locked as she thinks you know she's got a, a writer's block so that block gets removed for her too and maybe presumably now she'll be able to write so it's all about the writing process too that story is about the girl and it's also about the writer's own writing process so it happened like that and then the other story i mean i don't really have many magical moments as such in the stories in my stories maybe just the two i've read <laughs> just the two and maybe a couple more i mean i don't quite know how they how they enter the story like uh, there's another story i wrote which is called kam bolne wale bhai which is uh, set in chatisgarh and it's got in the backdrop some mysterious happenings that are taking place we know what they are you know and the sort of people getting killed and all that but at the end also there's a moment in which this person i mean i shouldn't tell you the story don't, because, don't tell me don't give the spoiler yeah. yeah yeah but anyway there's this moment in which all these jugnus suddenly become it's like a sheet of jugnus and they are they are signaling hope i mean there's also this sort of symbolism tied in with some of the stories in which uh, a, a certain description will add up to hope or will add up to something that is not consciously done but i find that it happens it becomes like that when i'm writing the story that i am kind of in a very subtle way giving a message so it's not really a message as such but it's tied in with the story but it does lead you to some kind of hopeful ending and how consciously do you think about technique or craft number 1 and a second question kind of tied into this which is what i have recently been wondering whether art and craft are really the same thing that art is just craft except it is craft at a subconscious level so you're doing something without knowing how you did it but it is really craft you've got into mm. that point because you've done something again and again and it seems magical yeah. and beautiful and it doesn't seem like there is it seems to transcend craft which almost has a mundane implication mm. but actually they are the same thing and one of them mm. you understand and you can break it down and the other one is happening at a subterranean level yeah Well in some ways uh, you're right i mean uh, one is of course i mean craft is very important in the writing of a story and sometimes the story is dictated by the craft also so uh, i mean the two things are obviously very tied together but uh, and the craft and art they are separate too i mean i mean there you firstly i think what differentiates it is that there has to be an idea behind the art there has to be something there it's not just the making of patterns or a making of and there has to be something central to the narrative something integrated there has to be some kind of vision some kind of vision to the story and for that vision you choose the appropriate craft you pro- choose the narrative style you choose the structure you choose the language everything falls in with that central vision so if that central vision is missing then i don't think it can be possibly be called art it's, then it becomes just a random pattern finely drawn but it's a pattern so i think that is the main thing that is different and when you kind of look at the books that you've written uh, uh, and obviously a couple of decades have passed since uh, you know you kind of resumed uh, writing in that sense after lucky horace what do you think of your earlier books do you look back and you think that oh you know i wish i could do it better or oh i really love it it captured that moment what where i was at that moment or do you think that oh another person wrote it it wasn't me i am now somebody else how do you look at your past work and you know well some of it i hate <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> I do hate some of it. Uh, but uh, I can see why I wrote it at that point and I can see the flaws. But there are some things that I wrote that I like even now. And I think, oh, that's, that's did I really write that? You know, that wow. kind of feeling. But I mean... Like what are those? Well, there's one story I wrote which was very close to me in my heart because it was actually something in my, that happened and I was kind of... Uh, changing it for the fiction but it did happen and it, it was a story which of my I mean my collection is called that it's called Ababil Ki Uran which is the flight of the swallow so it's about death and it's about superstition so this uh, I mean it's about this little girl and uh, it actually happened to me but obviously in a story it changes but uh, the death of her brother for instance so it's uh, in the story the brother dies and she's somehow uh, how can I say this without revealing the whole story? I mean, she's uh, thinking about death and there are all these sort of things that come in, all these little details that come in. She's lying on the lawn and this brother, she, she comes running on the lawn and the brother is uh, lying on the lawn and she jumps over him and she thinks it's about superstition. So she's been told that if you jump over, over a person who's lying there, that person stops growing. So she has this thing that she's killed her brother because he dies later and then she thinks, oh, I killed him because I jumped over his body and he stopped growing, which means he died. So basically there are all these superstitions that are knit into the story and right at the end, uh, she's traveling in a train where the brother has died and they, they have not been told what exactly, because she's a child, she's eight years old and she has not been told what has happened really to the brother and she's still thinking that maybe he's alive, maybe he's just hurt or something and she looks out of the window and she looks at the sky where a swallow is flying very high. A bird is flying very high. And she remembers that her brother, the one who has died, had told her that a swallow is the freest bird because it flies so high. It just flies the highest bird and even the falcon can't get it. So she immediately connects the two things and she thinks that if that bird is a swallow, then my brother is alive. Somehow that gets linked in her mind. And she looks at her mother and she wants to ask her that question, that is that bird a swallow? But then she doesn't have the courage to ask because what if the answer is no, it's not a swallow. So she's just, it, it ends at that moment. So that story, I still think it, I like that story and I still like it. So that's one of the stories that has remained. <laughs> but uh, yes, I mean, th there are some stories that I do like still, but some of them are, oh, what crap, why did I write this? You know, that kind of, and I can see the bulges, the bulges that needn't have been there and should have been done in a, crafted in a more, you know, fine way, and I can feel that these are unnecessary passages, and they could have. Why am I describing so much stuff like that? I I guess all writers feel like that after a point in time. So you know, before we kind of wind up, what's next for you? What are you planning to write? What are you working on? Will we see translations of your work anytime soon? Like uh, you know, I am in any case. I want to start reading Hindi. It's been something else been saying for yeah, a long time. Well, I, I hope somebody will translate them. People ask me, why don't you translate them since you are a translator yourself? But I mean, there are so many people that I can translate. Why should I translate my own? I mean, this this has come up, you know, that I should translate. and Because I loved your translations of your two stories. I mean, obviously, I haven't read the yeah. originals. But yeah. these read really uh, well. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think would also appeal to international audiences for that yeah, matter. Yeah, but if somebody would do them, then it's fine. But I, I mean, I don't not want you. to. Not, not for the moment. Because I don't know if at some point I change my mind, that's something different. But I mean, not now. So at the moment you asked, I mean, I'm working on those essays I told you, autobiographical yeah. essays in English. And uh, those should be finished. I think as soon as I get back to Allahabad, I'll probably need another 15 days to finish it because it's all done. I just need one more chapter. And, uh, and my book, the new Hindi stories book is coming out. Uh, the proofs are waiting for me. I have to look at the proofs and the, that book will be out by the, before the end of the year. So that's there. And then I'll begin on another uh, sort of maybe a novel or maybe another collection of short stories. So Have you ever see. thought of writing in English? Uh, fiction, not really. Fic I mean, except for that, the novel that I wrote, I wrote it first in English and I didn't think it worked. I didn't think, I thought it sounded better in Hindi. So maybe one day I will, but somehow, I think it has to be grounded in the language of the context. You yeah, know? I yeah. mean, if it's, let's see, I, I'm, I'm open to sort of looking at things. Maybe once I've got uh, past this autobiographical essays, which are also part of it, you know, it's never actually how it happened. You always add and, you know, subtract from things. So maybe I could write a book of fiction. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. 
but I'll certainly write another book after this. Wonderful. Two final questions. One is, what advice would you give young writers listening to this? Like, I know you've already spoken about the advice you would give yourself, which is, you know, write more and engage more with life and so on. In addition to that, you know, what are the common mistakes you see young people making? What what advice? Well, don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry to publish. Write something and polish it and refine it and revise it many times before you can actually. And don't write about things that are you think that this will sell or don't write for the wrong reasons you know so write for what you actually feel what you feel passionate about what you're committed to i think that is important in writing yeah and that is what will last so the final question uh, you know listeners of the show often enjoy it when uh, guests uh, recommend books for them so what are the books across languages yeah, what no. are the books which have meant so much to you that yeah. you want to tell people that read this now you must read yeah. this what what are those well uh, because we've been through this recently been through the pandemic and this whole thing of nature and how nature is sort of rebelling against what we've been doing to it so i've been reading two or three books around nature uh, one of them is uh, moth snowstorm about by this uh, british uh, guy called uh, michael mccarthy i think that's his name and uh, it's also a memoir plus it's a uh, uh, reveling in the joy of nature so it's a connection with nature so that's beautiful and uh, there's another one which is a similar book but it's, it's also a kind of memoir but uh, it's called uh, h is for hawk and uh, h is for hawk by helen mcdonald helen mcdonald yeah helen, that, that's also very lovely and it's also a memoir and it's got in fact several genres kind of mixed together in it so it's a very complex uh, literary uh, style also then there was a third book which i enjoyed which was uh, also around nature uh, it's about uh, birds the genius of birds uh, it's by jennifer ackerman and it's about how intelligent birds are and what like there's this uh, Caledonian crow I think it is with that or one of these birds I forget which one it was that hides 30000 seeds you know across these uh, and uh, so many acres of land and it remembers exactly where it hid those seeds months later or years later it just remembers and they're very very intelligent birds so all this whole thing of saying oh this one has a bird brain is complete complete nonsense you know birds are very intelligent so i've been reading that and then in the languages of course i read hindi and i read urdu so in hindi a writer i would recommend is vinod kumar shukl who's very good and i'm very close to his writing and uh, the other one is jyotsna milan she's also she's i think a very fundamental feminist i mean she would not qualify as a fundamentalist feminist in what they now the strident feminism but she's like she goes to the nuts and bolts of feminism she looks at what a woman is you know right from she views a woman from inside as it were and it's she's wonderful in that so there's jyotsna milan and uh, there's uh, uh, nirmal verma of course who's quite well known to people premchand if people haven't read premchand premchand is there then urdu is nayar masood he's my all time favorite he's there and uh, ismat chuktai and uh, i mean we read uh, this uh, what's the, uh, i just mentioned that name umrao jaan umrao yeah. jaan ada so that's very good so there are all these across languages and most of these are translated jyotsna milan perhaps not very much translated i have translated one story but uh, there are all all these others are translated so they can be found by the readers who only read english fantastic list and uh, you know about you spoke about those three uh, books about wilderness different aspects yeah, of it yeah. have you read the hidden life of trees by no, peter wolben no i Wallabin? haven't actually I, that's been on my reading list for a long time that uh, what's his name german sound peter wolben peter wolben and by with a forward by pradeep krishna well, exactly yeah, yeah, you must yeah. read that that's yeah, yeah. that's also yeah I've, i've just i've got that on my list So although my final question is over I might as well go to a final digression <laughs> which is you mentioned jo- Josna Milan being yeah. a fundamental feminist and yeah. different from what it's like today yeah, yeah. can you elaborate on that that's very interesting uh, well she's sort of looking at the woman I'll tell you I'll give you a, an example from her story there's one story of hers uh, again I've forgotten the title but I mean if there's a funeral happening this woman has died and this other woman who's the narrator of the story she comes to the funeral and this woman is right and they are talking about her wo bichari matlab wo to kuch bolti nahi thi whatever you gave her wo kapde wahi pehen leti thi kuch usko wahi nahi tha kuch bhi kaho wo 
कर लेती थी और एकदम उसका कोई वो नहीं था शी हैड नो डिमांड्स ऑफ हर ओन बट दिस वुमन ऑन द वन ऑफ द फ्यू डेज बिफोर शी डाइड शी टेल्स हर सिस्टर और हर सिस्टर इन लॉ दैट आई फील आई जस्ट फील लाइक स्ट्रैंगलिंग यू आई मीन मुझे मेरा तो मन करे कि मैं तुम्हें गला तुम्हारा गला घोट दूँ शी सेज and then she starts fearing her own hands and that she feels that something may happen to her that she you know some there's a kind of hidden violence in her stories which is the rage that these women feel who have been repressed and oppressed and all that and they have this kind of anger inside them so she just doesn't know it's like it's coming from somewhere some in her subconscious because she's you know and she just says these things and she's never been like that and on the surface she's this very compliant obedient sort of person so she's so she jochna kind of gets into the mind of such women and she's sort of looking at the woman from inside she's not you know she's i mean what it is to be a woman she's looking at that you know which which makes her a very uh, very kind of i think a very fun feminism at the very basic level you know she has to get to anything else first you have to get past the figure of the woman you have to know what the woman is feeling what she's going through all that you have to know no so in, i call her feminist in that sense wow that's that's fascinating sara thank you so much for coming on my show it's thank such an honor for me. me thank you for having me i enjoyed that if you enjoyed listening to this episode head on over to the show notes enter rabbit holes at will sara is not on social media a smart woman but you can head on over to your nearest bookstore online or offline and dig into her books you can follow me on twitter at amit verma a m i t v a r m a you can browse past episodes of the scene in the unseen at sceneunseen.in thank you for listening Did you enjoy this episode of the Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.